cheap producing company. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> you came while we're still philosophizing on the disaster of the world, the short of chips, the big mistake of Europe. Uh, well, I don't know about Europe, but also America. <clears throat> 20 more years ago, deciding hardware was not any longer important, or just a commodity that you buy cheap from South Korea, Taiwan, and, and now more and more from China. And so, well, good oh, introduction well, to, feel, to the philosophy about computing afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you yeah. know, and uh, software, software engineering was sexier than, uh, than hardware because, you know, why to produce hardware? You can buy it's cheap, it's a commodity. So no, uh, um, uh, those are reflections and listening to, to Luca Benini talk yesterday, lecture yesterday, who was uh, reflecting on that. And of course, you know, for him, who is, uh, is an hardware guy, it's, it's all good news that now people are panicking and, uh, and investing big in, uh, in microprocessor design. And in now being able to again attract the best brain to the hardware rather than leave them, you know, or lose them to the to the software. So I, I think it's interesting, interesting reflection that uh, we had with uh, listening to Luca yesterday. So 42 people and the time is, what am I? Eight minutes ago. So, Jesus, uh, you will be introduced by our colleague, uh, Maria. And I will just say a few words. Uh, Amalia, when do you want me to say a few words just to, to wake up the student before Maria introduce Jesus? Uh, I'd say we can wait until nine. Okay, so nine, I will just welcome everybody. Uh, I promise not to make um, <laughs> philosophical remarks. And uh, I'll leave the floor to Maria, who will introduce Jesus. And then uh, I don't know how long I will be able to stay because uh, I'm in a little bit of a personal problem to do with IT. You know, I mean, bank sent all my details to probably a Catalan guy whose name is Fabrice Grau. Unfortunately, I'm not Fabrizio Grau, I'm Fabrizio Gagliardi. So the bank sent uh, all my details to this guy. You know, this is, you know, it's the new world. Uh, you know, this young lady in the morning was maybe thinking of something else. So he sent all my details to Fabrice Grau. I hope he's an honest guy, like most of the Catalans, but not, you know, like every other place, probably not 100% uh, of the Catalans are. 100% honest. So I hope this guy is, because, but you know, it's incredible. I mean, the bank that has already sent me mail in the past, but you know, this money was to Fabrice Grau. Thanks God she copied my wife and she detected because of course we're never going to receive that mail. I have no access to Fabrice Grau mail. Do you know anyone called Fabrice Grau just by any chance? <laughs> what? No, not really. <laughs> well, we know. <laughs> I'm afraid Grau is quite a very common last name in Catalonia. Yeah, we, we, we but know. But Fabrice is not a very common uh, given name. Mm. Yeah, yeah Fabri Fabrice is more French. Yes. Than Catalan, yeah. No, we, I, I know, I mean, there is, a, there is a very, very nice friend of us, uh, uh, Carles Grau, that used to be the the public sector director for Catalonia for Microsoft, and now I think is working uh, for the for some other institution in in Catalonia. That is the only Grau I know, and well, now I know a second one, Fabrice Grau. So I will have to uh, go to the banks this morning, and have quite a war with with the manager. Yeah. Uh, Life is complicated. Mm. So for some reason, my computer has decided to stop giving me the time, but I will watch. Uh, 8.55, so five minutes to go. Yes. Yeah, I guess everybody is in a good shape, prepare for a third day. I mean, I'm so uh, happy because because of my previous experience in July where I had to wake up at three o'clock every morning. So that's why I, despite everything that's happening to me, 
I'm so happy that, you know, it's, I can wake up at seven, go and buy breakfast at breakfast eight. You know, it's kind of a normal day. So I am really sympathetic with so students who are in different time zone and especially the people connecting from the, from the West. Uh, they have to get up early. Our student from the East is much easier. It's already mid of the day for them, so, so it's okay. Jesus, where are you? Still on the Pyrenees? No, no, no. I'm in Barcelona. No. Ah, you're in Barcelona. I'm, at, okay. I'm at, the, at the office. Ah, you're at the office. Okay. So glad, glad you have an office. Okay. So I'll uh, <laughs> maybe come and uh, if you have a can, we, we can we can share. Yeah, if, 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 you, have a, if, you, if, if you have a chair. No, no. Uh, they do not complain. We are all in the same side. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but but you see, I mean, you know, it, it, when you keep being demoted, you know, you know, uh, I had a wonderful office sharing with the wonderful uh, uh, colleagues, and then uh, you get in a in a in a tiny place that uh, you're not sharing any longer with any colleague because you know the colleagues have gone. So no, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not pleasant. Anyway, uh, I don't think anyone uh, needs to know about our logistic problem. Well, they will get feeds. I mean, you know, the building is very nice. The building is very nice. And I think it will take, like everything, a good year for people learning what needs to be fixed. I mean, I'm not shy because if you're shy, uh, you know, you are in a, in a fish uh, glass bowl uh, there. So... So people are shy, they better stay home. For me, it's not easy to to um, to be in the, in the glass box. No, I mean, well, but, but you know, it's, you know, it's a very well-known problem. You just need to, 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 to ask the people who are expert in, in, in office. Uh, you know, I had that experience. It's very common in the United States, but then you put blindings, then you can cover. And I know that was an issue in Microsoft uh, in, in Redmond, the Redmond campus. So no, I mean, they're very well known phenomena. I mean, my probe is that since I know everyone in the surrounding area is very distracting because everyone passing through the glass without any, any, any blinding, I'm, you know, I'm supposed just to wave my hand and that distract me, then another person come and then maybe if I haven't seen the person for a while, I need to step up, open the door. And, you know, it's, it's very distracting, very distracting. So I'm planning to switch the office with Matteo and I have a beer before I close the door. I stay in the <laughs> and Matteo can be in the glass bowl because he's a more social person <laughs> to anyone. So I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just planning to switch the office with Matteo and then, then it'll be fine. Good luck. Yeah, and I will, but I will keep the bottles that are in the cupboard. That's 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 the only I think the touchy point. Okay, um, is that nine o'clock or what? Uh, oh, yeah, ten seconds to yes, go. Yes, it's time to start more or less. Yeah, five seconds to go. Seven, eight, nine. Zero. Top of the hour. Okay, so are all the all the student um, uh, able to? Uh, Listen to me while well, we have 48 people connected. So we're a little bit on the low side. Hopefully the, the other will uh, quickly uh, come up. So anyway, I don't have much to say, uh, except that I'm very happy with, the, with what I've seen in the first two days. Just, just regretful I could not be there every time with you guys, but uh, I gathered that uh, there were very exciting discussions. I they did. The content that I've seen presented are all very interesting. So I think the school, uh, you know, really got a very, very good start. And uh, most of the questions that I've seen come from the students are, are, are good questions. So demonstrate that the students have uh, the good level we're expecting. And uh, hopefully they will uh, learn. Hopefully they will learn. Sorry? 
Okay, I, I, I didn't get it. It, 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 it was an echo, Fabrizio. It was just an echo. I was an echo. Okay, so, well, I mean, I'm glad that also echo uh, uh, seems to be interesting what we're doing. So that's very good. It's an additional confirmation. Okay, so I don't want to waste your time in, uh, in chitty chatting. Uh, if there are any uh, housekeeping uh, issue, I will leave that to uh, uh, Amalia, and uh, I now leave the floor to uh, Professor Maria Rivera Sancho for introducing the first lecture of the day. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fabrizio. So it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Jesus Labarta to teach this morning lecture that will be on performance analysis and hybrid programming in HPC. Professor Labarta is the director of the computer science department at BSC, and he's also full professor of uh, computer architecture at uh, UPC since uh, 1990. He is now responsible of the, the POP Center of Excellence that provides performance assessment to parallel code developers throughout the EU. And he also leads the uh, Rich B Vector Accelerator within the EPI project. He also led the development of OMS and influenced the task-based extension of the OpenMP standard. He was awarded the Ken Kennedy Award for his seminal contributions to programming models and performance analysis tools for high-performance computing. Jesus, we are looking forward to following your lecture. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with, with us. Jesus, when uh, you can share your your screen when you are ready. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, just uh, let me make sure that I can see the the chat and the and the participant list. Okay. We now see we now see your slides. You, you see my slides. Okay, great. So. Good morning, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good morning everybody. Or I will be talking today mostly about these two topics, but uh, I think it's going to be a presentation with a little bit kind of uh, many kind of philosophical aspects or many, a little bit this, this situation when you get to a certain age, you have to, you start using arguments of HB for beauty and you start uh, presenting a little bit, a lot of stories from uh, sometimes repeated stories. I don't know, in Spanish, very often were from, from when you were in your military service or things like that. Okay, so it's and an, an, an insisting. So this is a going to be a little bit what, I, what I'll be doing. It's going to be a lot of philosophical things which are kind of summarized which are kind of summarized here in terms of uh, some concepts or some aspects or some views that I think are more important than others. So it's going to be a lot about uh, perceptions, personal perceptions of, of the importance of, of things, okay? So I will, I will kind of insist and insist and go over them, but probably these kind of uh, statements describe a little bit the, the philosophical aspects. And of course, as whenever you hear your grandfather telling you story, sometimes, okay, you may agree, sometimes you may disagree. And this, of course, you can you can do. If you want to discuss some of those, we can, we can extend the discussions. Nevertheless, the first thing I, I've gone a little bit through the, through the uh, profiles of, of a little bit of the people, but I would like a little bit to ask you where, where do you live? Okay, so the courses on, on the general courses on HPC and AI. I essentially live in 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 HPC land. Okay, I, my background and my my experience has been mostly on HPC topics and uh, and uh, regarding the architectural or the, the the layers of the computer system, probably. I, I have some interest in, in all of them, of course, uh, but uh, probably my major interests are at the, at the mid-level kind of uh, programming model runtimes, this kind of, uh, this kind of levels. I nevertheless would like to know, I don't know maybe if, if you can 
if you can use your raise your hand those of you who live mostly who are mostly interested by applications and, and algorithms by high level things so i could get a little bit of a feeling of of how is people interested on the high level stuff mostly choose mainly so the bit applications and algorithms okay uh, so maybe we can lower the hands and 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 have people raising hands people living in in the programming model and runtime kind of uh, layers whose major interests are developing those things or looks like not that many and uh, can people at the architecture and hardware level raise their hands Okay, we have a small sample, but probably more people in the outer and higher and lower levels. Let me try to see if if we can steer some of the discussions towards uh, some of those major interests. And uh, the final question is how many, if you lower your hands, how many people live in HPC land? And then I will ask how many live in AI land? So if, and how many, uh, okay, still HPC land. Okay, and how many in AI land? So. Okay. So it's uh, an interesting situation where I said I live in in the least common uh, or least uh, common thing of, of of interest with the people. So I live in HPC land and I live in this intermediate level. Hopefully, I can say during the presentation, during the lecture, I can say comments or statements that have to do with with. Um, or are useful for for all those people interested at the higher and lower and lower level. Let me let me see how it goes. If you have questions or if you have uh, interest topics to raise, please uh, raise your hand and or uh, or ask in the chat. And my my first general thought is about uh, about transitions in in history, which and and so you or revolutions, if you're not here, but if you think of French revolutions, what the difference, the, the situation with these things is what, what was the situation before and what is the situation afterwards? And even if these transitions may become a little bit, or in revolutions, for example, may become a little bit drastic in, or in some aspects of those are a little bit drastic, what I think is important is, is the underlying thing behind those is, is it's a change, a funda they take some time, but it's a fundamental change between considering, I don't know, ma uh, God as the center of, 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 of the world or man as the center of the world or, or considering energy sources, let's say, and you have industrial revolutions and you have kind of energy sources or you have uh, sedentarism. So there are kind of fundamental things that go behind these transitions, which can be more or less revolution, more or less shorter time, but there are fundamental things. And my perception, my point of view is that, that uh, we are, or we should be, or this is how I would like to see the, the world, is that we are in a transition in one of these revolutions. And uh, what was before was the, the latency age. We have been living in the latency age. Uh, we, we, I need something and I want it. And if I don't get it, I cry. That, that's essentially the, the situation. And this is what has happened in, in computing. I need to load the data and I have to pay the latency and I am and I'm suffering pain till, till I get the data. I want to communicate and, and same thing. The, the time for the communication is something that is very painful and and we are obsessed by that and we try to we try to minimize and reduce those things 
and and the belief is that uh, we should go to a throughput age and this is all in terms of of, of programming of parallel programming this throughput means actually the ability to instantiate a lot of work and tell a machine i have to execute all of these things and as long as they keep being executed it's not really that relevant whether they that takes each of them individually comes back or is completed very fast or very short or very soon or very late and uh, and I think we are living this kind of, of transition. In HPC, my perception in HPC, still a lot of people is very much in the latency mindset, in the, in, in the lat latency age mindset. So I will be talking about essentially about this, this, this transition, okay? And in reality, uh, if, if, if we look at what has happened in, in architecture in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, years or even 20. Uh, we have been suffering this multi-core revolution, which from my point of view, what I actually represented is a, a, a leakage in the, in the ISA layer architecture. Life was very easy long time ago. You had an ISA which a couple applications from hardware. And multi-cores, memory hierarchies, all those things essentially introduced the a significant leakage in terms of what this layer could be used as the coupling the two things. It, before that, we knew, yeah, you have caches, you have these kind of things uh, tell you that it's better to work by rows or by columns, depending on the language. But but now you end up having to know much more about the internals of the of the architecture in order to exploit it. So this has made a huge uh, complexity being exposed to the programmers. And combined with the variability, which is something we have here, which it's there, we we no longer know what is the frequency at which a processor runs. It's totally probably totally dynamic and changed adaptively by the power management systems, for example. So these these kind of variabilities are causing a divergence between our mental models, how what we think a machine is or how we think it behaves. And, and the actual the actual behavior. And what this has caused and is causing is an increase in the size of the applications. You end up having applications with plenty of if defs just to fill, to address different characteristics of, of different machines. And the vision, the thing is, uh, what do programmers need in this in this context? And my belief is that what they need is, is hope, is just, uh, somebody or something or ways of telling them don't worry very much. Uh, however strange or complicated the hardware becomes, you will see interfaces that are that are kind of uh, clean, that are kind of uh, architecture independent in a sense. And this is what what uh, I think is is happening or should be happening. This is what we have been working in the past on how to promote these kind of things. For example, at the level in my case and our case at the level of parallel programming of 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 machines. So reintroducing a certain level of uh, of decoupling between applications and hardware. In our case, was by by doing uh, runtime uh, uh, developments and. Uh, and we believe, I believe this layer has to be something like a general purpose kind of uh, layer. And it has to be, we believe it has to be something like a task, uh, uh, task and database. I will be talking about this. Uh, next thing is, or well, this is, and, and this vision is for a programming layer. I'm talking at the level of MPI and OpenMP. And I don't know how many people, can you raise your hands? How many of you are familiar with MPI? Okay. Okay, people is familiar. How many of you are familiar with OpenMP? Good. It's like more people even. Okay, so uh, the way the, these layers, I'm, I'm talking about those, that level of programming, of programming models, okay? I'm talking about MPI, OpenMP, very general purpose programming models for, for essentially for parallel computing, but on, on, on every kind of target machine. What do we have? There's a question. So no, 
no question. So uh, uh, the, the no, next I, point. I, I, as you say, I think what you're hearing is student entering and the Zoom system, you know. Made. OK. No, okay, it's... fine. Sorry. So, so but... carry on, carry on. Good. So uh, the, the next thing that happens in order of reducing the size of the applications is that we actually end up having libraries and we end up having DSLs and we end up having frameworks. And, and it's an issue, a question of how much this should be the, the core of the system or how much effort should be developed to these things. And I believe, I believe these things uh, are something that should be and is very useful for productivity and should allow for fast prototype for fast prototyping, one of the important things of these things is they must be easy to develop and maintain, or they must be sustainable in the sense that there is a sufficient community behind them and a sufficient uh, economic uh, force. And, and, and for example, this is an area which certainly, for example, between uh, HPC and AI, HPC is much smaller market and AI is a real it's a really much larger market. So the scales, the order of magnitude of what is sustainable in one or the other is, is different. That's why, for example, frameworks are one of the ways of, of again, raising layers, this layer of abstraction and hiding again from, from the actual, from the actual uh, hardware. What uh, I would like to insist is on the importance of these layers to be like uh, osmotic membranes, okay? What we said at the beginning is that the ISA lost that capability of decoupling layers on top from it to, to between levels on top and below because it started leaking a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, holes that uh, were there mixing, really allowing for transfer between the two layers. And, and a strong belief, I think, is that these layers should be like a osmotic membrane that let you convey from the level on top to the level below some information, but in ways which are clean, are decoupled, and are not really a total mess, mess mix of the of the, the the different layers. In this context, also, for example, one of the things I believe, and I will be talking about this, is this ISA that has been become so so leaky. Let's say. Uh, it would be nice to kind of raise the semantic level of this thing. And uh, I'll be talking about vectors and, and vector architectures as a possible way, I think it's an interesting way of uh, raising the semantic level of, of this uh, ISA, uh, kind of generating more, more less words, more, more work, more rock, okay? so is, is uh, and re eliminating or reducing the kind of uh, leakage that you have in this uh, in these levels. So I'll be talking about this, and the final thing. This is probably the kind of vision that I personally am more interested. Uh, there is another thing which I think these days uh, what has been mentioned. This kind of non ISA based approaches, where essentially you have at the very high level you have DSLs or you have libraries which have direct access or direct control of a specific, so not this of here, a specific hardware features of the, of the machine and this, uh, these uh, libraries, uh, as long as you are not interested on the internals and you use just the framework, for example, you really don't know what is inside it. So the application interface is, is just raised to this very much higher level. So in this context, essentially, this is what has happened with, with HPC applications, okay? So you need you had a need to solve a given physical problem, you wrote the code, you started growing the code, growing the code, and increasing features, and probably sometimes changing and spending a lot of effort to change a lot the, the structure of the code, for example, porting it to a GPU. And, and uh, I think this thing is kind of making codes grow, as I said, and I think what is important is to give kind of the programmers of the users the, the possibility of saying, okay, there's, there's a still the possibility of going back to simple codes, which are easy to understand, easy to maintain, and, and still uh, they do perform on platforms. This In this history, there has been uh, many of these things have actually may include you do here for for taking benefit of a given machine you do here a refactoring of a code 
which essentially what it does is just to make much more difficult the refactoring that may take place in, in two, four, five years when a new architecture comes. So this is something that I would, I, I think we should try to evolve in that direction. So in this context, I, I will, uh, I will, uh, these are the topics I will be, I will be dealing with. So this is more or less about the introduction. I will be already talking a little bit more about the introduction, uh, about topics regarding the introductory introductory to introduction concepts and a little bit of an opinion on what co-design is or where should it go. But then I will be talking about two of the levers, which are, I believe, extremely important in order to, to really steer that, that development of, of application. One of them is performance analysis, and I will be giving a description of some of the analysis and methodologies that we have been developing. And uh, I will be talking about best practices in, in parallel programming, how, how I believe uh, parallel programming should evolve and how should we address and adapt our applications to address the very large scale executions. And finally, I will be spending in a, another uh, section on, on an architectural level on, on this vector processor type of philosophy that, that uh, I, th I, I uh, supported and that we are developing in the, in the EP project. So essentially, the idea would be to develop kind of essentially one hour to each of these uh, three topics and then uh, uh, a little bit more now to the to the introduction i the idea would be to make a small breaks between between these between these sections but a little bit as as it goes and, and, and whenever we get to the interface should be essentially around one hour I had here sets of slides on, on, on HPC programming. You've told me that you're familiar with MPI, you're familiar with OpenMP. Just a little bit of the vision of, of, of current machines, mostly kind of very high level of this, of these um, uh, architectures where you have clusters which do not share memory and inside the cluster you have shared memory and, and memory hierarchies, let's say within within the node and, and essentially our mental models are to characterize and describe these things by numbers of nodes, by the bandwidths or latencies that we have in the interconnections or describe the nodes by features like parameters like number of cores, bandwidth or locality or how many flops they can, they can do. This is kind of the abstract model to which we, to which we program. Uh, in MPI, you mentioned you already know, some of the things that I, I consider very important is this fact that in MPI, these message passing systems, you essentially start by distributing the data. And then after that, you kind of distribute the computations, which essentially, well, distributing the data means that you have to really change the allocations. And this is a little bit cumbersome compared to the original, let's say, program space, uh, algorithmic space. There's this other thing that you have to change your, your iteration space traversal. So your loops have now to iterate on the iterations that touch your local data. You may need to access or to refer and think sometimes some parts of the algorithm may be using the local index and you can use them with the local index. But sometimes you have to use the, let's say the global, the global index. And these are some of them. Uh, some uh, fundamental issues of fundamental complexities in, in, in MPI program. Of course, you need to communicate, you may need to communicate and this communication may be, may be collective or maybe point to point communications, but uh, this, this, is, this is there, this is going to, to be there. I think uh, in HPC is going to be there for a, for a long term. There's a large basis of, of codes that are MPI codes. In OpenMP, you don't split your data. You just have a single address space. And on one side, this is a, this is a good thing. The only thing you have is to split your computations. And, and OpenMP is very typically very fork joinish, let's say. And uh, with pragmas, you say which loops you, you spawn or you execute in parallel, let's say, and which loops you, 
uh, you don't also which part of the code you don't execute this this parallelism but it's very much of a for join kind of parallelism this probably maps or targets better shared memory architectures uh, which much physically have hardware support for this possibility of load store capability on any thread on any variable well hybrid programming i think this is this is uh, the idea to to leverage let's say or combine both approaches trying to get the best of both worlds okay this is this is the objective or the the intention not necessarily what we achieve when we when we get do Hello? this uh, hybrid program uh -huh. yes how do you so hello can you can you mute please okay so um uh, the the possibility of hybrid programming can leverage the the benefits of, of the best of of both uh, both worlds and that's the funda basic idea is not necessarily what everybody experiences when when doing hybrid programming it's is you have things like uh, I don't know Andal cost locality effects and so there, there there are many aspects and this is a little bit the situation where where our our mental models uh, may differ we may we may end up doing things different from what we actually do them so that's why I think in this context it's very important not to fly blind not to uh, to not to be flying your plane in the mist and trying to just blindly say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to to reduce to pack messages, or I'm going to paralyze these loops, or I'm going to port this part to the GPU. And very often we we do these things in a very blind approach, okay. And and we need to really know and understand the behavior of our applications. And in reality. It's important to do one thing when when you go when you go to the doctor you feel bad and you go to the doctor you don't you should well you don't I mean maybe you, some people does but you shouldn't let's say you shouldn't yourself take an antibiotic before going to the doctor okay I mean you should go to the doctor show the full symptoms and he the doctor or she will decide what is what is needed so I think we are in, in this HPC world and. and we really sometimes do very much this thing. We we see a performance inefficient that we are not getting the performance we want, and we start doing blindly doing this, this, and this, and this other refactorings, and we end up with with uh, mixes that uh, essentially uh, hide the fundamental characteristics, fundamental issues, and try to give local solutions to things that will not be sustainable or will not be really useful in the future. So this is uh, I will be talking about this part of uh, of uh, of performance tools, which I believe is extremely important. In the part of uh, programmability and programming, uh, introducing asynchrony and overlap, I think is is very important. This is what I said before about this this uh, latency and this and this uh, throughput orientation. We should then move towards more throughput oriented type of approach where we are now today very very much latency this for join this i do one thing then when i finish i do the other one then i do the other one these kind of things are are very much latency bound mentalities because i have to finish what i'm doing in order to start the next thing and 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 we have to to introduce a lot of uh, or, or think asynchronous let's say and i will be talking and and, and giving some comments about about these things in terms of Malleability is this capability of adapting to, to the dynamic uh, availability of resources. That's also something very important. As I said before, the good old times where we knew what is the performance of a core, what is the frequency at which it is running, where we knew all those things are gone. I mean, variability and, and, and the loads and the characteristics of the old loads, it's the, all these things are going to be very, very, very variable in the system. So we need to have applications that are kind of adaptable to, to dynamical, uh, dynamic availability of resources. Okay, so this, these topics, I will cover them during, during the, the presentation, mostly on the performance analysis and on the, 
on the programming model practices. I have a few more thoughts about uh, still in the general in general considerations about about uh, co-design. Okay, and uh, I think co-design is a bit of a buzzword. Okay, it's just used very much and without the real I don't know real real some content or real semantic or, or really at least well let me say not the way I would like to to have it very often uh, co-design is saying okay let me take let me put a one user or a customer one vendor let me put them together and and they are going to do one one machine and and I don't I mean yeah, it's not a very good model from my point of view what are we asking? Are we asking the vendor to do a machine that will be extremely good for this user? How many machines will that vendor sell? One to this user? And how much will it charge? Well, probably the user will ask for a discount because he has cooperated in the design of the machine. So very often uh, uh, co-design has been mentioned as, 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 let's say, Putting together users and vendors or developers and and uh, uh, a vendor will not for one user will not really adapt a whole design for, well unless it's a really economically powerful user okay but but this is for the general purpose HPC world that that we are thinking are thinking this is a little bit of 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 a difficulty. Other thing that I don't like in, in co-design very often is that it's considered as, as a top-down thing. So we all want to do co-design, and which means we all want to put in the hardware, we all want to put uh, some feature, a new instruction, a new. And uh, uh, I think this is a very limited view of, of co-design, okay? And this limited scope is very often is just, well, just one very small instruction or just one very small aspect. Other thoughts about co-design. In, in order to do co-design, one, one of the things is you have to design. And, and each of us, based on where we live in, in, the, in, the, in, in the hierarchical, in the hierarchy, we have to be aware of what we can design, what we are designing and what we can and which, what is within our reach. And, and uh, very often we talk about co-design on, on, on for selling things, saying things that others should be doing. And in reality, I think we should be very much aware of what is what we are designing. And if what we are designing is applications, maybe we cannot do a holistic co-design over the whole chain, but we can actually uh, kind of try to influence those levels where we really have some level of design and focus on those levels or a partial co-design or those levels where we have some some actual design capability. There's a final thing is co-design and co-dimensioning sometimes just saying how many cores to put. Uh, to me, it's not really a co-design. It's, it's just choosing out of the possibilities that the vendor gives you, who the vendor has done the design, out of those possibilities, determining how big the system is. It can be seen as a little bit of co-design, but it's probably not that much from my point of view. What uh, would I like to, for co-design? I would like it to be steered by a vision on and a holistic vision. So uh, something like what are the fundamental concepts and that are pretty much the same, probably it's not the same physically, exactly the same thing. And and there are effects that uh, that if you enter into one level, they, they, they are, I mean there are there are details, but I mean the Newton equation in reality has been it covers a very wide dynamic range, it's not quantum mechanics, yes, but covers a wide range and is valid on a very wide range of, of levels. And having a single vision, I, I think is, is a very important thing. And having it steered by, by detail for the side. So this, this is kind of for me an interesting objective. So what I see as co-design is given all these levels, uh, is not just one of them influencing the other. It's about what is the best place to address when you have an issue, trying to identify what is the best place to address that issue. What is the fundamental characteristics, the fundamentals of the problem that you are trying to address and, and determine whether it is better to 
address it by introducing some changes or some improvements in runtime, some improvements in the kernel, some improvements in the where it is better to, and maybe for some problems, it will be kind of a combined kind of thing. So a holistic type of thing that with a minimum, I mean, the will, right? With a minimum amount of material, you are able to sustain a, a really strong structure and really useful structure. So the idea is about how to minimize and finding out what is the actual cost of this, of, of, of these things, okay? And try to decide to put the, the cost in a more balanced way in the, in the place where that requires less cost, less material, let's say. The other thing is what happens is, as, as you saw John presentation yesterday, some time of these things are are not available to you. You cannot co-design, okay? Maybe a little bit like, not a perfect situation, but uh, things are how they are. And if you cannot, you cannot. And each of us has to see what is within our reach. It would be much better probably to be able to do the whole thing. And these are the efforts that we try to do. But uh, but if if we have certain things with, uh, with which are out, not within our reach, we have to try and still survive with uh, by by touching and, and balancing the the system between the things that are within our reach. The other comment about the sign of uh, and this is all of this is a little bit related to what uh, John mentioned yesterday. Okay, so is is uh, designing a system is a huge effort. Okay, so you cannot do everything together, and this actually has been understood in, by by even by companies and by large companies. Okay, so you have to 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 really go to to open source kind of uh, components that you can leverage you can adapt and you can decide where to where to innovate and where to contribute and 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 that is uh, for example in our case and this will be the the final part of the of the um, of the presentation uh, RISC 5 for example poses gives us an opportunity to contribute and leverage and open and have also access to the lower levels and it still has the, the characteristics of a standard and broad the thing essentially the whole thing about this uh, has to do with uh, as we said minimizing the effort that you need to to do something and for that you have to you have to take and you have to give so to sustain the the model. So you 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 try to introduce your your innovations and you try to contribute that upstream or on the on the different infrastructures. The thing, nevertheless, of this code of designing a system is 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 relatively at the end. It's a relatively complex kind of kind of equilibrium. Okay, and and we said trend very often we as we said uh, on the on the introduction to to this code design we are sometimes very very eager very very much trying oh i've got this wonderful idea that i want to put this specific instruction and 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 we are very eager and very much thinking of a one day shine kind of uh, opportunity and uh, i would like to move the thing more towards uh, something where you go to generality to 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 elegance to productivity to think what would happen in five years from now in 10 years from now in terms of the impact of those of those uh, designs and anyhow the design of the system i think is, is a really complex uh, much in topic of, of maturity other comment i wanted to make about this is how holistic is how what what can we do uh, willingness sorry uh, uh, what can we do is what what i said here what can we touch if we cannot touch something okay or maybe we are we don't want to touch it. Okay, so uh, how holistic can we go? It would, it would be nice to be as holistic as possible as a unified, single unified approach uh, at all levels, but but we have to acknowledge, understand our situation and acknowledge our possible limitations, okay? And, and well, there are many other challenges. I think uh, this is more or less, I, I covered this thing. And I, I'm going to proceed to a little bit more approaches to describe some of the visions, some of the philosophies I think I, I would like to stress in terms of of uh, getting to to exascale. And, and you had two basic approaches. So you have very strong, uh, I mean, probably could have put elephants here, okay, too. But this is something from the Basque country, okay. They, they enjoy pulling stones with few, large, big, powerful engines. 
or you can take your approach of going through many, many, many very fine grain. And these are philosophies that you have. This can be kind of this vertical type of thing of a unifying type of approach. And we can decide where do we live? What do we want to, where do we want to go? We want to be there. We want to be here, something like make a mix of these things. Uh, uh, and th there's a difference, I would say, between making a mix of things which are totally unrelated and a mix with things which are kind of uh, symbiotic, where actually they, they have different capabilities that they essentially help each other, okay? So this is uh, the discussion or the, the thought where you have to say, where do you live here? Probably you would have something in the middle who would be full farm and probably a little bit a total mess, okay? But, uh, but uh, I think it's nice to think of what is our fundamental kind of this vertical philosophical type of approach. I would be personally more keen on this kind of, on this kind of thing of kind of symbiotic interaction between maybe a few kind of uh, device capabilities, let's say. So a little bit more about these these philosophical principles of where you you place you place yourself, and these are some of the ones I I believe are are important. Okay, and the first one is kind of thinking of balanced hierarchies. I I would like even if you use the level of parallelism at workflow level, or at MPI level, or at, within OpenMP, which probably nesting. So what do we think of? Of we think of a single level, of few of these levels, and some of these levels providing very high levels of concurrency. I mean, this is, for example, the kind of situation I would, how I would describe GPUs, okay? One GPU with huge amount of, of course, of, of resources to be devoted to one functionality. Uh, personally, I would be more keen on situations like this, okay? In order to get a million cores working together, you can have one, let's say, parallel loop executed by, by them, or you can have 10, independent parallel loops are executed by, by 100,000 of them, or you can have different levels in the hierarchy, each of these exploiting, let's say, a parallelism of a given, of a given granular level, so 100 by 100. So this is what I would uh, kind of suggest. And for example, I will be talking about EPI and the way I see it, for example, in EPI, the lower levels are architecture. The, some of these levels are in software, but some of these levels are in hardware, whether you put them in software and hardware, but it's kind of a balanced hierarchy where each level contributes with a granularity level of a few tens or a few hundreds maybe, but, but kind of a, a balanced hierarchy. So this is a philosophical kind of approach. So in this, from this point of view, it's essentially not to go to this, this thing of a single level, a single whole farm of, of this little uh, chickens and um, pushing. So it's kind of more uh, balanced and more each level uh, contributing. So this is a philosophical thing, let's say, from my point of view. In this latency to throughput evolution that uh, I've mentioned, we do think, or I would like to think my personal, my personal belief is that we have to go towards task-based models, okay? And uh, I will be talking a little bit more about this. This has to happen, this actually, Fundamentally, if you think of it, it's, it's the same idea. What is the task-based tasks? What are long vector instructions? Vector is, is conceptually just like a task, operates on a certain amount of data, like instructions at, at, the, at the architectural level. So it's kind of this task-based potential of asynchrony, potential of out of order execution, all these kind of things is kind of uh, what I think is going to provide this asynchrony and this overlap. And this may happen at even at higher level, and you will hear tomorrow Rosa, for example, talk about uh, task-based uh, computational workflow. So, and and the, the same mechanisms, the same ideas, kind of being exploited at uh, at all levels. Okay, so this I believe is 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 an important characteristic. Try to try to see all these levels as actually belonging or having or con being constituted by the same fundamental philosophical understanding uh, of, of how to achieve parallelism, okay? Uh, the, and another thing is between all these levels, we very often in today's practice, they are very often decoupled. So you have a specialist in, 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 in OpenMP runtime and the OpenMP runtime 
is really not that well coupled with the MPI runtime and it's not that well coupled with the operating system scheduler. And this is a situation which I think is 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 wrong. I think we should be we should have more coordination between the scheduling, between the decision and the, the composability and the interoperability between these layers and the scheduling decisions between those. And the, there is really what when I mentioned the, the osmotic membranes is how you achieve that with a minimum so I'm not advocating for for, again, for for opening those those making holes in the in that in those osmotic membranes. It's how with osmotic membranes that decouple as much as possible, but still you are able to convey information from the higher levels to the to the lower levels. Okay, so and uh, I will be sorry, I will be uh, talking about these things uh, later, but this possibility of dynamically coordinating, for example, the, the, the OpenMP the open MP resource allocation with the MPI or with the OS resource allocation. But, but the same idea happens hierarchically if you think of RIS-5 and you think, but also, you know, but this is the idea of vector length agnostic programming, okay? So this situation where essentially the ISA level uh, has a, a disosmotic membrane that essentially uh, the loops, the program, the code asks the system, how many resources should I be using for this loop or for this uh, for this code? And the system feeds, tells you how many resources to use. So this is uh, opens the possibility for a dynamic coordination between these layers. And this is what happens, for example, on the RISC-V vector architecture, where essentially you can have a loop that, that essentially the loop asks for what is the vector length to be used and the hardware has the possibility or the ability to, to, to steer or drive or decide what is the actual vector length. And, and so these are these osmotic membrane mechanisms that allow uh, communication between layers without this full leakage, with, without the higher level on top having to be aware of everything and all the reasons why the lower level takes a decision. So I think this is an important uh, characteristic in, in terms of uh, designing systems. And uh, I will be talking about uh, also about the programming model, the open, let's say the way I, you look at, at heterogeneity. So it's, it's, it's can be, it, I mean, it, it's a nightmare. If, if we end up offering all the many different interfaces and for every device, a new interface for the programmer, I think it's, it's we, we need to, if we want programmers to survive, we need to homogenize the heterogeneity. We try to offer them a virtual, Interf an interface where, where really they don't see so many things changing. Whatever changes inside, it's okay, but it's a little bit what uh, Bill Daly was mentioning, and it's a little bit what happens with with uh, with DSLs and with frameworks, okay? People essentially see the framework and doesn't see whatever it's inside. Well, this, this homogenization of heterogeneity, I think is something that can happen uh, or should happen at all levels, okay? And actually, for example, this vector length agnostic has helps a little bit in that in that direction, okay? And, and for example, OpenMP, and the next thing in OpenMP is something that helps in that direction. I will be, uh, I think this is an idea that should be steering our, our developments as much as possible. So these are this kind of Abuelo Cebolleta thoughts. I mean, this is a personal perception, I think. I mean, of course, sometimes, to, in order to get this, you may get, you may have to give up a little bit on peak performances for a specific case. Sometimes you give up. My only comment is sometimes you give up. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you gain. Okay, by by give, trying, but not trying to be too eager, too aggressive on optimizing for a specific given heterogeneity. And in the long term, that was another of the common elegance in the long term. I think pays off really a lot. So the final comment on, on, on this, all these things is that, again, is to insist on the need to do that with microscopic understanding of the microscopic behavior, okay? It's, it's interesting what happens, for example, with why people do simulations of materials, okay? Because they want to, the, the microscopic characteristic of a material, of, of the atomic structure of a material determines it, its macroscopic behavior. And so that's why we try to evaluate different microscopic, microscopic uh, structures. 
well, something similar should be done. I mean, we sh and I will be insisting on this. We should be looking, or we should have the ability to look at the internal microscopic behavior of our systems. And that's, that's very important to understand how they really behave. So these are some examples, or, so projects or activities that we have been done that will be kind of on which the, the presentation you'll be doing will be, will be based, okay? So uh, essentially this is about the, the introduction. I don't know if there is any question, was it uh, sufficient clear to high level? Uh, any, any question? There are questions you can uh, put it in the chat or open your mics. If not, uh, if you, uh, I think probably because this is going now to be the the the, the topic, the second main topic. Maybe you can take a very very short break, five minutes, okay? And and this session will be a little bit longer, so we'll we can take now the the very short break, five minutes, okay? Till nine fifty. Six. So five minutes break, thank you. Okay, so we will continue with the second part of the presentation, which is on, on performance analysis. And uh, essentially the idea is try to, to get this, try to avoid flying blind in the mist, try to uh, understand how our systems behaves so or behave. And uh, so just a little bit of uh, justification or what or why to use tools. And, and of these things, probably from this slide, what I would like to, to comment is, is this point, oh, by the way. Uh, I can, I understand, I guess you see my mouse. Uh, is is tools are important to really know what to blame, who to blame. Okay, very often I do believe that we very often tend to tend to blame mm, things very easily without really fundamental uh, evidences that that is the case. And 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 we this is from my point of view a very very important uh, objective of tools is to really identify what they are the fundamental the fundamental causes the fundamental problems that that we have because not really knowing the fundamentals or really who to address or what to address will help us improve the performance and the other thing i would like to do is to do to kind of vindicate the, the role of performance analysts okay it's curious i mean when you go to doctors and they they look at the uh, radiographies, NMRs, or whatever it is. And I don't think probably they, they are very, very big experts on, on what NMR is or, okay, or image reconstruction algorithms, or they are not, but they can, they can look at this place and they can tell you what has to be done in order to heal a given wound or whatever whatever it is. So I would like to, to vindicate the role of performance analyst, which is not actual, the developer of the application is somebody who essentially understands, looks at the, at the different displays and understands the information. And, and in a sense, is kind of an informed speculator, okay? It's like, 
like the doctor, based on this and on, on the training he has and the experience, he's able to give you fundamental reasons. Is that the total truth? Sometimes maybe not, but very often, I mean, it's, 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 it is. And it's based on, on real, uninformed uh, data, okay? So this, this is something I would like to, to vindicate. In a situation where, you know, the, the saying, the Schumacher song going barefoot in Spanish is the blacksmith eats with a wooden spool, okay? Is that we use computers, as I mentioned, to really study the universe or design new materials or, but in order to study uh, the machines, we essentially use things like printf and like timers, okay? And it's, it's a situation, kind of a strange situation. We have instruments and, and very, very powerful instruments for, uh, for studying science and, and for measuring and for, for understanding the behavior of, of these systems. And, uh, and for understanding the behavior of our own systems, we, we do timing, very coarse, level grain timing. So essentially we talk about something like this, which is one number, we look at one number and we speculate, oh, the function has these characteristics or the problem is that the cache is failing there or the problem is, so it's, it's, it's something like, uh, looking at the number and talking about the function of time. And essentially because we get very coarse grain, very aggregated type of information. And what I would like to claim to indicate is the, the need of tools that would let you do very, very detailed, look at the microscopic effects and try to quantize, to quantize those. So uh, this is uh, this kind of uh, deep and powerful performance analysis tools is something that that uh, we have been working at BSC for a long time, many years by now, in terms of, and in and use them in the analysis of HPC applications, and this is the the focus of what I will be presenting on this area. This is the overall kind of infrastructure you can download these components from from the website. Uh, the overall infrastructure is you run a program with an instrumentation package, which essentially in our case is essentially extract, which captures the, the activity of the program, what the program did when, and Jimmy emits that into a trace file, a .prb trace file. We have another .pcf, which has symbolic information, but this uh, the timestamped information is emitted into the .prb trace file. And this trace file can be browsed with uh, Paraver, which is only, it's just that. It's just a browser to visualize, uh, well, maybe manipulate also those, those .prb, .prb files. And I will be mostly talking today about, about this uh, Paraver uh, module. We have mostly, uh, there, there's, I'll be mentioning some other things. We have the possibility in the framework of taking these uh, traces which describe what happened on a given specific of the machine, of the program on a given machine, and, and process it through this, through this path and generate the MMS and generate again another trace. And what we achieve in this thing, in this, in this path is to do what if analysis of what would have happened if my program had, my machine had had different, for example, latencies and bandwidths. And, and we build a, a synthetic simulated reconstructed uh, the trace of what would have happened under those conditions. We have uh, a scriptable, so no, non-graphical versions of Paraver, so it's totally the same thing compatible instead of, of painting uh, colors and tables in a screen, it actually generates ASCII files with the statistics, so it can be scripted. And we have analytics models where we do apply clustering or other techniques to, to the performance data itself. For some reason, as I said, we like the Shoemaker's uh, son going barefoot. For some reason, we tend to do a lot of uh, AI type of things and a lot of uh, data analysis type of things on data from many other areas. And we don't do that much of that on data coming from the 
from the machine itself, from the from the describing the behavior of the machine itself. And we try to do a little bit of that. These are other tools and other framework environments that we do have in our BSC tools that you can download here. I will not be talking much about those, but uh, but it's it's available there. And in a sense, if you think of it, or the way I like to think of it is, uh, I mean, if, if you really want a big data kind of problem, I mean, trace a, a parallel machine with a million cores generating events at a rate of, even, I don't know, if every few microseconds, you really generate easily and rapidly huge amount, amounts of data. So it's really a big data application, okay? Anyhow, my focus today will be will be on 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 this this thing mostly, as well as methodological aspects for the analysis of this of this application. I will be giving presentations. You have material documentation here. You have examples, and I will be giving some other links where where you can have kind of much shorter presentations, but uh, kind of hands-on uh, demos of, of these things. And you can download that material and you can, you can really use it yourself and follow the, follow the material yourself. So the first thing is just to mention what is, what is the trace format. And the trace format, the trace is, an ask, is just a, a sequence of records which are time-stamped time -stamped, uh, events, sequence of events. So, uh, and it's in ASCII format, and uh, the for every line you have a time a timestamp in in nanoseconds, and it says at this nanosecond there happen and you have several events. Each event is described by by two numbers, and these two numbers, the first one is what we call the type of the event, and the second number is the associated value for that type in this at this point in time. So th this this can be. We have certain predefined uh, types, for example, for MPI calls, for uh, hardware counter reads, for and 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 essentially, uh, what you say if it's an MPI call, the number on the I don't remember which of these is an MPI call. Okay, but uh, uh, if it's an MPI call, you will have on the right you will have an identifier of which is the MPI call that you are entering. If it's a hardware counter, and I guess this is a hardware counter, on the right you have a hardware counter, the actual read of that hardware counter, which means since the previous time you read the hardware counter in this thread, this is the number of, if these were instructions, this is the number of instructions executed. So this is the format. Of course, this record with its timestamp is associated with with a, with a, an app, a thread, an object uh, of the of the program, and we have actually an identifier with three fields to describe the thread. We the, we have a, an identifier of an application because actually we could instrument several applications, concurrent applications. So we say to which application this record belongs, which is the process inside the application, the rank of the MPI process inside the application, which is the thread inside that that rank. Okay. So this is the fundamental information. There are also other additional uh, communicate. Uh, there's a mistake here. There are additional communication records, but the fundamentals is is that. That is numeric. It's, it's all types and values. This is numerical information. This is what the browser sees and uses. The only thing is that the instrumentation package can generate additional symbol uh, translation information that uh, kind of translates these numerical values to symbolic strings that can tell you the kind of information that event represents. For example, in the previous one, this one represents the puppy total cycles in since the previous uh, run. So these are the two traces, the two files that constitute the trace. And then in this context with these files, what is Paraver? Paraver is essentially just a browser to visualize and to manipulate also to, you can, you can really operate and cut and, and and, and filter those those traces and generate additional traces derived from the from the original one, but essentially is to to visualize again sequences of timestamp events, and these sequences of timestamp events is the, the tool itself is agnostic of what dot those things mean. So the, it only sees sequences of types value type value type value type value. What that type value means. The tool is really totally agnostic, and the, this mechanism allows the tool to show some 
some symbolic information when you present the displays instead of uh, showing numerical values. But in reality, the tool is total, totally agnostic. Okay, and, and this total agnostic mechanism, uh, essentially the tool has a, this mathematical foundation mechanism for, for displaying, determining how to display that, that data. I will describe it in a, in a minute, but what this essentially makes is, is the tool can be used to visualize uh, not only parallel program performance at the MPI and OpenMP level, also at uh, we, have, we can instrument, it's, it's, it's just a matter of what you can instrument, what you can instrument and put in that form. We can instrument MPI plus CUDA, we can instrument other programming languages, we can instrument pthreads, uh, but but it can be used for many other things. I mean, in, we have been using it, for example, to display, to visualize and and and, and, and analyze the behavior of, of 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 tooling machinery, so spindles and voltages and currents in in a in an industrial site of of the different uh, heavyweight machinery tooling in, in in that industrial site. Okay, so it's it's extremely extremely generic. But it happens to be used mainly for performance analysis. That's how, where it grew up, where it was developed many years ago. And, and, and that's where we mostly use it. But it's, it's just an abstract mathematical mechanism for going from sequence of timestamp events to, uh, to a displays. And uh, I will come to this. We, we try to encourage or favor a, a multispectral philosophy. I will, I will come to this. This is, if, if we talk about Paraber in one slide, this, this, this would be it. So what we have is we have a trace and uh, we want to display uh, timelines. This is the, the sort of two basic display mechanisms, timelines where you have in this dimension, you have time. In this direction, you have one row, one line per thread, let's say. And, uh, and uh, what we display, and this is the, the, the fundamental thing is what we display is functions of time. The engine of the, of the tool essentially computes functions of time, which of course happen to be uh, piecewise constant. So for in a given interval, the function of time has a value in the next interval has possibly different, different value. They are piecewise constant functions of time. And this value, we call it semantics, we represents uh, can represent the a, a one metric with, out of a huge amount of metrics, actually an infinite number of possible metrics, which can be computed by the previous modules. But typical kind of metrics or, 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 or semantic values are, for example, what is the identifier of the MPI call I am in, or what is the actual megaflops in, the in, in this interval, or what is the actual Kashmir ratios. In, in, in this interval. So this you can represent or could be voltages, I don't know, or power or could be, as long as the information is in the trace, this is the semantic value that you, that, that, what, that we display. And, and what we have is many of these functions, one per thread, and we display them on the screen. Display is one of the important things of the display is kind of a non-linear rendering mechanism. You will have, you'll have many, many of these functions. If you have a thousand or 10,000 processors, you don't have 10,000 pixels, okay? So what the, the, thing is, uh, the thing is, what do I put on every pixel? How do I render every pixel? And the thing is, we have to select out of the many functions that essentially go for the many threads and, and actually also the time interval that goes into a given pixel, how do I decide the value that goes into the pixel? And the whole idea is how I do it in, in a way that conveys the maximum information between, between the internal data, the actual raw data in the machine, which the machine handles, and the human and the human brain. Okay. And in reality, I mean, you many of you were in AI, yeah, and what is from my point of view, what is the core of AI? What is the heart at the heart of that is is is, is nonlinear things, okay? And, and what we have here is this displays, nonlinear rendering is one of the very, very, very powerful, extremely powerful uh, capabilities of conveying this information from the actual amount of data handled by the machine to the actual uh, human analyst brain. In reality, many people typically tend to do the screens very large. And I would like to discourage that. No, there's no way, there's no way that you can, you want to 
to display every individual MPI call or every individual in a single screen. And, and first, because we don't have those screens. Seconds, if I don't know how much would you pay for those, probably it would be wise not to pay that much because the real limit is your eye. The human eye is not able to really, if you have, uh, you display to it, uh, I don't know, 20 megabytes, 40 megabytes of data or, or 100 megabytes or, or, or like one gigabyte of data, you cannot, you cannot process it visually. So this is this nonlinear rendering is very important. The only common difference between these two things is some of these functions of time, sometimes they are categorical. So they have a few discrete values, an integral value. And sometimes they have a, a real value or a large dynamic range value. If, if it represents hardware cache misses, it can be a large, or instructions or cycles can be large values. If it represents MPI call, well, there's a handful of those. So, there, so the only thing is this rendering can be done towards uh, coloring, so a table of translation table of coloring, or can be represented as a gradient. And in our mechanisms, in our approach, we, we use gradients from light green, so uh, light color to a dark color as, as to represent dark for large values, light for low for, for uh, small values. And uh, so these functions of time are computed out of the original data by getting through a filter, which decides a subset of the trace. So if I'm interested in cash misses, I only look at the events of type related to cash misses. And then from this filter to have a semantic model, which is the heart of the engine, which translates the sequence of events into sequences of values, okay? And under and and intervals, and in, we call burst these intervals, okay? Which can be sometimes very large, sometimes very short, because it depends on where the activity of the program happened and how long is the MPI call or how long is the computational phase. This semantic model is that the heart of the parable and is what constructs, what builds, the functions of time that you will represent builds the sequences of value time, value time, when the, the, the starting type of the, of the value. And this is what is, what is rendered. So it, this semantic module has generic mechanisms, predefined generic mechanisms to build some, some functions of time, but it also has the ability to derive the, to, to derive the operations. I will comment a little bit of that, although I will not go into the detail, as I said, for many of these things, you can you can look at the other material. I, I will I will provide, and you can do even your own hands-on examples. So this was mostly about the timelines. This is one kind of uh, of uh, of display. The other kind of display, which is very closely linked to that, is tables. Here uh, you have time as one of these dimensions. Here we get rid of that time dimension. We still keep one line per thread per object, and what? But nevertheless, what we put in the columns is one column per possible value here. So if this was MPI calls and every color was uh, an, a given MPI call, and there's an MPI white is I don't know MPI received maybe or so there are some whites here, some MPI receives. So what we put here is one column for MPI receives, and this column. The, the value in, in, in each of these entries is in a statistic, which is also we have very flexible mechanism to compute those statistics. But this, this is a statistic that can represent, for example, the percentage of time in that, in that MPI call, for example, can represent number of instances, number of times you got that value, so number of times you called MPI. But it can be a much more elaborated uh, statistic, can be I don't know. I, I don't know who's interested, but would someone be interested in what is the IPC inside MPI send, or what is the number of instructions executed inside MPI send? So all of these things can be, all of these statistics can be, if you are interested, you can obtain them. So the possibility is a huge number of statistics that you can compute. So it's profiles, but it's you, you through the GUI, you decide which specific variant of a statistic you want to you want to compute and the very same mechanism so there's only it's only one mechanism very same mechanism which here we apply to something which has a discrete set of, of values we can apply it to something which has a very large dynamic range of values and in that case what we cannot physically do is one column per possible value okay 
So what do we do? Instead of one column per possible value, one column per range of values. So we have bins, and so now we have one column represents one bin, and so what this ends up being is a histogram. And in this case, this metric was the useful duration, so light green, so very short useful duration. Useful is computation in user level mode, so not MPI. Dark blue is large computation, so, so this is uh, um, long useful duration. So you can build a histogram of those things, and you can see that sometimes the lines are vertical lines. So every these are here you have a number. I don't know how many processes this has, 100 or 200 processes. You have 100 or 200 histograms, and, and, and what you see are the spikes of the histogram. So one law is one line is is the is for each uh, three, for each of those histograms, and you see that they all of them have a spike in the histogram at this distance from the origin, so at this bin. So all of them compute for this amount of time. I'm not saying where in the timeline. I'm only saying that somewhere in the timeline this thing happens. What I'm saying here is somewhere in the timeline we have this this thing. So different threads have the value, the spike at different places in this histogram, sometimes more to the right, so it's longer computation, sometimes more to the left. So this is this is these are the two fundamental mechanisms for for Paraver in for visualizing the, the, the large amount of trace data. We because setting up these things is a little bit cumbersome, what we end up is we can save those things into a config, what we call a configuration file, which essentially is nothing more than a DSL for describing the process of how you transform the raw data into displays or a statistics that you can that you can display. And we provide with the distribution, we provide many of those. You can do your own and they can be used for cooperative analysis to share and to steer the, the analysis of, of your collaborators maybe for to, to give in a specific regions. Let me go to this multispectral uh, consideration because you have this, this thing being used in many areas of science. So you have look at a given object, a given reality and with a different spectral bands because each of those spectral bands gives captures different fundamental behaviors or characteristics of the system. And you can even combine them and generate uh, synthetic uh, images that highlight a given characteristic. So we would like to do something similar to that in the, in the analysis of performance. So rather than having one single view, you using the full screen, we'd like to have things like that. Smaller views, each of those looking at one specific aspect of the behavior of the application and leverage the ability of the human brain brain as a, it's a great correlator. So you, you can actually, by looking at several of those, try to correlate. And if this one shows you the MPI calls, this view, this look at the reality, this lens, looking at it with at the same trace, same part of its number times, same number of threads, but looking at it with this lens, you see uh, how long those computations are. With this one, you see how much IPC each of those regions gets. With this one, you see how many L3 misses per thousand instructions you get in that in, in, in each of those regions. Maybe here what we have is an indication the color represents which function was calling MPI. So do you have a link to the to the source code? And the thing is that you can actually start thinking, okay, this region has very long duration, but it's on one side has bad IPC, much worse IPC than, than others. Here you have scales of the amount of the level of IPC that you have. And you may start thinking, okay, maybe it would be interesting to to look at the IPC here, by the way, the IPC, when you compare it with the L3 misses, this is non darker than other regions, but, but there are other regions which are as dark as this one, and they have much better IPC. You can start uh, thinking of, of this, uh, correlating these things and trying to understand what is the fundamental reason why, for example, the IPC is bad here. Maybe with more, you might need other views, and the idea is to, this multispectral thing, to look at multiple views and, and correlate, visually correlate those things. You can do that with the timelines, you can do that with, with tables or histograms, maybe each table representing a different statistic or for, for example, for every MPI call, what's the percentage of time that you devote to each of those and, and you see the values are, in this case, they were low, most of the time is outside of MPI, useful, but still you can see how many calls, 
you can see that not everybody does the same number of calls or what's the average duration. And you can see that not everybody spends the same amount of time on this call. And this call is not this, this specific call, which is uh, all reduced, is not called many times. It does not represent a lot of time individually, but the, but the average duration of each individual instance, it does represent longer, longer time than, than, than all other MPI calls. So the idea is to be able to do this kind of analysis and to do this with histograms, for example, of histograms of useful duration and, and describing what's the percentage of time or describing how many times you have an execution of that, of that specific useful duration. But you can also represent for each of those what was, for example, the average IPC. And we see that there are regions here that have this number of instructions of useful duration, sorry, but had poor IPC. We have here regions that were short, fast, uh, faster, short, le less, more to the left in terms of useful duration histogram, and that they had higher IPC. So you can you have a kind of extremely powerful capability of of computing distribution of values of of metrics, and of correlating metrics between those. Okay. And you can do these things beyond not just HPC. We have traditionally been doing it within HPC, but you can, I mean, we, we, are, we have people, for example, running on specific problems, ResNet on PyTorch, and, and we can look at the, at the traces and you can still get, look the same kind of, same kind of multispectral type of information and as, well, probably actually have different metrics. I will talk about them, but you still have the traditional ones, the basic ones, which is how long is the computation? And we have, well, we have regions here with only the, the main thread works. We have regions where very fine granularity and fine granularity looks like close to one dot, a few microseconds, very few microseconds. We have regions with larger granularity, close to seven milliseconds, okay? Uh, these are outliers, so there are light orange uh, regions that are less than 1.5 microseconds. Dark orange are regions that are larger than 7 milliseconds. Okay, so you can look at how long those computations are. You can look at how much IPC you get inside those regions, and sometimes you get better IPC than others, and you might be interested. Well, you might. Uh, typically, this is the thing with frameworks. People typically say, so I'm using the framework, the framework is is optimized and is using the, the resources uh, ideally. And, and well, the only thing from my point is that maybe yes, maybe not, maybe. Okay, so this is the kind of things that we also would like to, or should I think be looking at what our framework is actually achieving in terms of the performance, at least from the point of view of the computer science uh, or operator of the an infrastructure might be, might be interesting. You can instrument the, the application and you see where you are in the forward or backward steps of the training or, or even the actual specific layer in the network. So, and, and you can compute uh, other views, other metrics, like what is the instantaneous parallelism, for example. And we see that we have regions, these regions of very fine granularity, all of these are synchronized. These regions of very fine granularity actually in reality we are not achieving a, a really large, uh, a really large parallelism, and uh, we also not achieving a, an average IPC, which is very good. There are some regions, and, and actually you can navigate zoom, and you can zoom, and you can see that in some regions you do get good IPC, some regions you don't get not so good IPC, some regions you get good parallelism, some regions not so good parallelism. So. Our feeling is that it's the tools are interesting. It would be interesting to really understand and look and think and consider possibilities of even going further in terms of improving the performance of, of this uh, AI uh, infrastructure uh, frameworks uh, systems or how they are used on a specific on on, on a specific uh, data sets. Okay, so this is about the tool. So what I'm trying to say try to say is. And now a little bit more about the usage. So that was the usage, a little bit about the internals, but I, I think I'll, I'll probably go very fast through through here. Uh, just to mention a little bit how you go from functions of time, from events to functions of time. You have a GUI that is able to, 
to select, say, what we said, I'm going to select a given event or set of events, and you see the event types that you have, you see the possible values, for example, this event represents MPI calls, and the value three is MPI I send, the value four is MPI I receive, five is MPI I wait. So you can decide which events to look at, and, and then this is what you will get. You will get the events in the timeline, this is just looking at two processes, and the events are, are not uniformly distributed because, because the events happen when the MPI call is done. Sometimes you do many MPI calls in very, very close to each other. Sometimes you do a lot of competition between them. And uh, so this is what you get in terms of, of selected set of events. The next step is how do you transform from your selected set of events to functions of time? And there is a set of predefined predefined operators that led you in the semantic, in the control of the semantic module, let you determine how do you uh, build a function of time. And typically some of those is last even value. This is predefined operator that says at this point, what point, what function of value will I return as a function of time? And here is the last even value. So it's then you go to the last, to the previous event, you see what was the value associated to that event. And that's the numerical value that the function, the semantic value that the function will have in all these intervals. There are others. So there is what is you have, for example, for hardware counter events is next event value because actually the hardware counter, the instrumentation package gets the data at the end of the of a given region. And you want to display that semantic value, that function, in this case, for example, number of instructions, you want to display it during the execution where those number of instructions were, were executed. So this is a basic mechanism, as you see. Is totally agnostic of what this event was, the, what this means. Okay, it's up to you to, because you know how the data was captured and, and, and you know the mechanism, you can generate the, the functions time that you can save. Uh, there are quite a few of these predefined uh, mechanism, uh, mechanisms to generate functions of time. We have further documentation where you can, you can see it in. There's that's kind of the mathematical description of how this, this, uh, um, the semantic functions of time are described. There are some of those that are based on communications and are a little bit more elaborated, but that let you do analysis of, of message passing communications, like message passing activity. What I think is important is these are functions of time. So on the basic function of time, you can apply compose operators, okay? And you can compute, for example, the, the sign of a given function and the sign of the given function will tell you Another function that will be zero if the original one was zero and one if the original one was different from zero. And you can actually do something which is combine pointwise operation of uh, different functions. If I have a function of time that tells me loads, a function of time that tells me stores, I can add them up and I have a function of time that tells me of memory operations. If I have a function of time that tells me cache misses, I can multiply this value by 100 and I can uh, I can divide it by this other value and I have the L2 miss ratio as a function of time. So it's a very flexible algebraic mechanism to compute a very large number of functions of time. And you can essentially derive your, your uh, the specific selected uh, uh, metric and, and display that metric globally for the whole, for the whole uh, set of processes. The, this is a little bit on the rendering. There are these, as I mentioned, I mentioned before, there are several nonlinear rendering mechanisms because they may convey more or less information on a given screen of a given small size, uh, like like here, for example. In this case, we, this these functions of time were were uh, categorical. The values were only a limited set of values translated to colors, and the function represented in this case, the OpenMP parallel parallel function. So it is here by rendering with the mass at every point in time, you you see what was the OpenMP parallel function by by all the threads represented by this pixel and by all the time interval represented by this pixel. You can do, a, there is a very nice, from my point of view, very informative kind of nonlinear rendering, which is random. So out of the many threads and many time intervals that want to paint something in a pixel, choose one of them at random. And it does give you a lot of, of information and insight about the structure of the application. It tells you there is very fine granularity things here. There is essentially uh, most of them are red. So it, it, it gives you 
a lot of a, a lot of uh, structural information. One of the things that uh, that happens is that certainly not all of the renderings, and some of them may be linear, by the way, and in this case, a linear rendering like the average is not semantically relevant. The average between routine A and routine B is not routine C, is is, is meaningless. And the same rendering can be applied to, to real valued uh, large uh, dynamic range functions of time. Okay, you can apply maximum, minimum. And this is a very nice way, uh, as well as for rendering functions of time that are uh, only, only one function of time, by the way. These are aggregated functions of time, the same way that you have one per thread, you can actually aggregate in the vertical dimension. And if these are, these are cache misses, you can, you can really get the cache miss ratio as a function of time for the whole application. Okay, so this is about the, the rendering. A final thing about, uh, about the, the basic mechanisms is how do you go? We mentioned that we have a relationship between timelines and tables. And essentially we show that you can go from timelines to tables. And in the table, you will have a precise, numerically precise, totally accurate quantitative metric for uh, the, the a statistic on what every thread did when it was it was having this value, a specific value, each of these specific values in the timeline. So this is kind of qualitative conveying information on, on spatiotemporal structure. This is quantitatively precise accuracy. Thing. And by the way, what we see is this says there is some some weight here. Do you see weight? Because of the rendering stuff, you really is 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 difficult to see it. Or do you see green? Or do you see? And the question is, what if I were interested? This is telling me there is some white. What if I am interested in seeing the white in the timeline? Well, you have a mechanism to go from, from tables to timelines, which essentially you select the given area and it pops up a window where you see regions that have that value and only that value. So for example, reality, there are plenty of whites here. We don't see them because the red, because of the rendering mechanism, the red, the red just gets priority over them. But there are plenty of whites. There are some pinks, yes, there are, and the structure. So you get structural information and detailed information. You can, essentially, you can find needles in haystacks, okay? This is qualitative. You go to a quantitative, totally precise, accurate. If something is there, even if it's one nanosecond out of 10 seconds, you will see the one nanosecond will appear here. You can go to the timeline and you can find that one nanosecond in the timeline because you will be seeing only that specific uh, behavior. So this is extremely powerful browsing and navigation capability, okay? So we do provide CFGs that uh, for the standard instrumentation packages that give you very typical metrics and both at the per thread or at aggregated level. And what essentially I would like to do is just to refer you to uh, either the BSC tools webpage where you have training material or the POP. POP is this project where we are doing using the tools and the methodology that I will now briefly describe. We, will, we, are, we are actually doing assessments of, of uh, the behavior of uh, many parallel applications throughout uh, Europe, okay? And uh, so this is the website, and here you can you can get uh, additional or more detailed descriptions of many of these topics in terms of the usage of the tool, as well as the methodological aspect that I will be covering in in a couple of minutes. So I encourage those of you if you are interested on is is to use this this reference uh, material. Nevertheless, yes, again, in this in this dimension, direction of, of vindicating the, the, the analyst role and, and trying to think of the scientific method, let's say of this loop of generating hypotheses and validating them or at least building evidences, which is something that we use very much in many other areas, but still, I think there's a lot of speculation in the performance analysis field, there, there is a lot of speculation without real validation or re, either precise quality, quantitative, total precise quantitative validation or even just qualitative evidences. Okay, so we 
what we think is that the tool provides the mechanism and it's just the instrument, okay? It's, it's, it's not going to, it's just the instrument for you to let you observe a system, let you generate hypotheses and let you validate those hypotheses. In order to validate those hypotheses, you, you have to think, okay, this would be the metric or this would be the view that would uh, validate that hypothesis. Do I have this view in the, in the, in the configuration files that are distributed with the tool? Do I have, a, of course, first step, do I have the required information? Okay, if I make a hypothesis and my hypothesis is, oh, the problem is uh, branch mispredictions and that's causing the, the real problem. If the trace doesn't have hardware counters on branch mispredictions, no way to, to validate in the hypothesis. But if it has, then you have to look, do I have in the distribution do I have a, a configuration file for visualizing branch mispredictions? And if you don't have it, the, your question is, I'm able to generate it and save it and have it for future use. And this is a little bit what I think the tool should be used for. It's just a tool for helping validating or helping providing evidences. And the th But the thing is very often this loop of, of hypothesis validation in the typical practice of performance analysis is is very, you, you, you iterate very few times over it. Uh, very often those iterations require additional executions. This is the standard practice. What, what the, the tool lets you do, I think this kind of tool is out of one trace. You can do many, many, many levels of iterations. You can drill down, drill down into that, the, the, the search space of possible problem causes of the problems. You can drill down quite, quite deep out of a, a single trace of a single original trace run. Sometimes you may want to, you may need to add additional, yes, but but it's not, uh, it, I, I think it's, the, and we should do this is kind of uh, out of a single experiment, try to really squeeze the whole information available there. And and again, I've said it several times, analysis system is it's very important, I think, to try to analyze the let's say original or simple versions, even if we know that they have problems, because we may be aware of one problem, but they may have other problems or different problems, and it's it's important to try to try to start with uh, with uh, let's say for example in my case my suggestion always will be start with pure MPI, okay, even non very optimized versions, and, and try to avoid uh, yeah taking antibiotics before going to the doctor, okay. But still, if you want to do this analysis with the tools as I have presented them here, this is a very possible situation. The trees can hide the forest. We, it's very easy to get trapped in a local hole of thinking of, oh, I've seen, I identified this effect and there's very bad cash misses here. And, and you start looking and drilling and, and zooming in and out in, into that region. Uh, but uh, you may be missing the whole the, the global picture. Okay, so we really need to to have a to have a, a global picture that helps us kind of steer the analysis and and decide where we want to look at in, with a little bit more of global information. And this is what I'm going to to refer to now. I don't know if there is still till this point there is any question, any any comment. Uh, I think there is something. There is something before Paraver, how we collect the PRV and PCF files. Okay, uh, in in the package that we distribute, I mentioned in the, in the overall picture, there's this extra, extra uh, instrumentation package. So essentially what you need, what you have is, uh, you need to install this extra instrumentation package in your parallel machine. The basic mechanism for the basic instrumentation for pure MPI and open MP prompts, what you need is just your binary. We don't need source at all. You just need your binary. And what the Stripe package uses is LD preload. Typically, this is, well, there are other mechanisms, but this is LD preload and essentially intercepts MPI calls and open MP calls. Okay, this is so extract, you run with this LD preload, you run your application uh, without source code, of course, as, as I said. And, and that generates the PRB and PCF uh, trace files. There is, as, as we said, because this is very generic, there are other things, there may be other packages or other, other variants that uh, capture 
well, extra itself also captures uh, CUDA, but uh, also captures P3, but you may want to do, I mean, I've had people who did, for example, translators from S trace to Paraver files. You want to visualize the output of S trace, you can do your, and then you have to do your own translator. Knowing the, 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 the format of the file, you do your own translate, translator. So it's uh, S trace, uh, to Paraver, we have people, we have, I will talk at the end on EPI, for example, you have instruction level simulators, you generate from the simulator itself, we generate the output in the Paraver format and you can visualize it. But for parallel applications, MPI and OpenMP is essentially extract, which works through LDP. I don't know if there are other comments or questions. If not, I will go. Well, so, I actually have a question. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is um, he, I'm attending school from Nigeria. Actually, the the software that has been presented so far, the tools that are presented, presented so far, actually related to the behavior of a uh, parallel system after running the analysis or whatever the goals have done. I'm actually interested in knowing are there tools uh, from the uh, from the programming language perspective that helps that helps you debug. You mean so the question is to debug the program? Yeah, uh, for, yeah. From, yeah, debugging tools uh, from the perspective of the programming language. Uh, so so the, so that I think if if you're asking, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. If you're asking whether this is a debugging tool, it is not. So really, for our case. As a debugging, uh, this requires the application to work. Okay, your the application has to work, and you instrument and the trace generates kind of a snapshot of the picture of the events as they happen. It, it so it's not a, a real function. It's not GDP. It's not so. It's it's, it's uh, total view. Whatever it is, is not is not doing that. This this debugging. If if the question was, can you relate the performance information to program level structure, something like uh, to source code line and, and these kind of things, the answer is yes, you can, okay? It, as long as this information is captured in the stride, you still try to capture information, for example, the, the colors to the MPI, uh, we have other mechanisms for like sampling, for example, or we have other mechanisms where you really can get uh, call stack information and then you, you link the behavior to the to the to the application source code, but it is kind of it, it would be as a mechanism for kind of kind of performance debugging. It's not a functional debugging for the language, right? Oh, thanks. Any other question? Okay, so let me let me talk now a little bit about methodology. What happens in the typical analysis methodology that people has? Uh, very typically, you run your program with uh, different core counts and you paint your scaling plots of what is the speed up, you compare it to the ideal, and maybe you compute the, the efficiency. And from here, this, from here, we can kind of argue, oh yeah, but the communication is very important and that's why I get this performance loss or, and this is a very typical, typical situation. I would like to argue that it is important to get some more insightful information. From my point of view, the actual time or the actual profile information is not really uh, the fundamental thing to blame. If you do an MPI program and you do an MPI profile and you say MPI all reduced takes this a lot of time, so let's go and blame the MPI implementer or let's blame Intel or whoever it is. And that's not a real fundamental behavior and a real fundamental insight. Uh, it is, uh, so the, this thing of profiles, I would like to try to avoid it. And I would like to argue, what I would like to argue is about the importance of going through a more elaborated, uh, well, the, the answer is, I mean, the, the, the reason is, is MPI is like a gas, okay? It fills whatever space you give it. Sometimes API takes time in itself, but very often MPI just fills the space that your structure of your application gives it. So profiling it is not really very insightful. This is this is a point again as this in this I will say you might disagree. I would like to show you that this is 
and important stuff. And I would like to drive you through a kind of a performance analysis journey of the methodology that we try to push in order to understand the behavior of applications. And the very first step is to identify the structure of the application. And this is sometimes in itself even an important thing. Very often, you know, don't know how many times we have seen codes on traces where we obtain the trace of the code and we tell the guy you are, well, this, this thing is happening and, and the guy says, no, no way. And, and you look at it and, and, and this thing is happening. And maybe, I mean, the applications had hundreds of thousands of lines. The make files are hugely complicated. Uh, maybe they forgot something in, in, in a make file for an experiment they did some point in time and you forget that and that stays there and there's, there's a behavioral thing uh, that is still there. So what I'm trying to say is just even understanding the behavior of the application, the structural, the overall structural behavior is an important thing to, to in itself, but it's certainly very important to focus the analysis, to, to decide I'm going to analyze at this part. And the, the, the next point is, I mean, now you, you have this thing of the permafrost, uh, the freezing, okay? And you go to Siberia, you go, you go to there and you find a, a mammoth and you find the whole mammoth or big bones or, and you want to sequence it. You don't put the whole mammoth into the sequencer, okay? You kind of go and try and extract a, a small clean region of a tissue that you can put in the, in the sequencer. Okay, so something like that. For the performance analysis, there's no need to look at the whole thing. It's important just to understand the structure, identify what is a significant, relevant, representative region, and, and, and look at it. Okay, so this is the objective of the face identification. How do we do it? Typically, we do it by looking, for example, at some of the specific views, which expose a little bit the structure. Like you have MPI calls and you see repetitive structures. Useful duration is very semantically insightful because this is actually the useful the duration of the user level computation. So this is very semantically insightful. Sometimes may, so you see identify what are initializations, you identify what are iterative patterns, but sometimes you may find out that it is not totally iterative or at least not the very same behavior at all the iterations. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a looking at these things is sometimes can be something like this where there is, it is really not that, that easy to have a really repetitive structure across the whole program, even if there is repetitive structure within, within a subset of the threads. Sometimes it's not that easy. Very often it's also not, not that difficult. And it's an important part to really identify, okay, identify a region where to focus the analysis. Maybe sometimes it's the whole thing, sometimes is uh, maybe a small part of it. So you have to identify is the thing of, of the mammoth. You get the part of the tissue that you want to put into the sequencer. Okay, here you get the part of the tissue that you got to fit into the, into the next step. And in reality, you can actually cut with Paraver, as we said, we can cut the trace and obtain, for example, this is that we identify, maybe these are four iterations, okay? Or, and, and so I get the four iterations of 48 cores, 96, 394 cores. And, and this is how they scale. I can compute the speed up efficiencies, and, and, but this is very coarse kind of information. This is again, not telling me fundamental structure. So what we try to do is, uh, can we get some efficiency metrics that give us fundamental structure, fundamental insight of the behavior of the application? Can we make a model of the, to describe the application behavior? And as, uh, I like this, this statement from your, so all models are wrong. If you try to get a real model, a perfect model, I mean, forget about it. All are wrong. Some are useful, okay? The idea is try to obtain some models that describe the behavior of the application in a way which is usable and helps us understand the overall characteristics. And we use this kind of model, a numerical model, which is just uh, the, very few metrics, load balance, serialization and transfer or load balance and communication efficiency. It's a multiplicative model. This, each of these things are numbers of efficiency. So between zero, essentially between zero and one. That multiplied provide you a given number of a, a parallel efficiency. And this describes the behavior of your parallel application. And this is an absolute metric in the sense 
that you make a run and from this run you can you can compute how much are you losing because of load balance how much are you losing because of communication either transfer or serialization and these are semantically insightful and these are quantitative numbers that quantitatively tell you how much you lose ideally you should you would have like to have the beneficiency of one and uh, an efficiency of 0.5 is, is that you are throwing away half of the processors essentially because of because of that metric. There's another part that influences the global efficiency when scaling prones, which is the, the, the computation scalability. When you increase, even if you are when you are doing strong scaling, when you increase the number of, of parallel programs, uh, really uh, the IPC at, uh, at 100 cores is not necessarily the same IPC as 1,000 cores. The number of instructions, ideally strong scaling, the total aggregate number should be the same, but in reality, many programs is not. Frequency, something similar. You run at one core, with one core, you run with a full node, and the frequency of the processor is very often not the same. So you must need, you, you should have the kind of these numbers that give you a globally holistic kind of metric on the, on the well, structure of, the, of what are the fundamental causes of performance loss. And uh, how do, you, do we obtain this, these models for the parallel efficiency part? If, you, if we represent here a parallel where here we have useful computation in blue and everything else, so MPI time in, 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 in yellow, this is the total last time of a real run different threads and then this thread finishes the last and this is the total elapsed time. One of the things that is, how much do you blame to transfer? So what uh, you should blame to transfer is a comparison between this real elapsed time and the time it would have taken if transfer had been instantaneous. And the idea is, can you make a simulation and estimate how long would the application be if transfer had been instantaneous? If you can, uh, this this difference is going to tell how much you you pay because of transfer costs. There's another, of course, here you have holes. Why? You have holes because of dependencies. Sometimes you are waiting for a message and even if it uh, is transferred at infinite speed, you have to wait for it. What would be the, the balance if you were able to pack everything to the beginning? What would be the distribution? And this distribution tells you another fundamental limit of, of the parallelism, which is your load balance. Be this guy taking more than the others, these processors will be idling for some time. How do you measure, how do you characterize load balance? And people look at the standard deviations, these kind of things. Those in our model, in order for it to be really semantically of stating how much it contributes to the overall de performance degradation, the metric is, is this one. It's compute the blue divided by the blue and yellow, which essentially means dividing the average divided by the maximum. Okay, this is, this is the, the way of computing load balance, the average time taken by all processes on average divided by the by the by the maximum time of, of the, the process taking more time. So this is a way of uh, how you determine in this in these uh, metrics how you determine load balance, how do you determine transfer and the rest is blamed is, is the thing that is blamed to serialization is difference between what really would happen with infinite transfer and what really happens would happen if you had no dependencies. So we call it serialization, essentially is dependencies. It's the fact that sometimes I wait for you, for you, sometimes you wait for me. If this happens, we will be losing this time and we will be losing efficiency. So this is essentially the way of computing the model and we first assign blame to load balance, then to transfer and the rest to serialization. Something similar we can do for the sequential efficiency parts, which means uh, what the number of instructions should be the same even when you scale in a stronger scaling case. The IPC should be the same or the frequency should be the same. This is ideally, but the thing is reality is that they are not. And you have to quantify a little bit how this impacts the overall performance uh, evaluation behavior. So. The efficiencies are not the end of the journey. They are not the causes of, of, of a given problem. These are just, this is just a model, a way of describing 
and observed behavior, okay? And uh, I think it's a fair way of comparing different code versions, different architectures, different applications. You can end up doing things like, well, this this was done by hand. You, essentially what we do is you, you can cut the, the different traces. You have a, a Python script that uses um, para the mass and some, some of the parameter stuff and essentially generates tables essentially like this, where you have the efficiencies for different core counts and you have the different uh, fundamental factors. And uh, you have to look for, for things. Sometimes there are very often you get surprises, okay? So you didn't expect uh, instruction scalability to be bad and it comes up, it's bad. Sometimes you would expect you have to look at trends and see, oh, my serialization efficiency is getting worse. Sometimes you have values, for example, for computation scalability, which are actually getting better. Not very frequent, but happens. And, and it has to do in this case because of IPC scalability for this code. So there are, there are kind of frequent surprises. And, and this is a mechanism that lets you do get very, very well an overall description of the behavior of the application. Is, is, the, is the model, is not the causes, okay? And the causes, you have to go and look for them. And, and the problem is machines are complex. The causes are correlated and it, Cause can influence many different factors of that fundamental view. And different causes can be combined into one of these factors, but at least a very first layer of uh, being able to talk between applications and analysts and between even application developers of different machines, I think is, is this, this uh, mechanism, this, this model and these uh, causes. Um, I had more slides that I'm not going to go into the details about those. Uh, probably the only one I want to look at is about transfer efficiency, for example, okay? What happens when you have a bad transfer efficiency? How do we determine who, why or, or, and where it happens? And here, essentially what we have is we have a tool, which is the MMAS, which essentially out as I, that I mentioned in the, when talking about the structure, which act, starting from the actual run, you can, this is the trace of the actual run, you can do simulations with maybe ideal, so zero latency, infinite bandwidth, well, zero is actually infinite bandwidth. And, and this is what is being used for the model. And this is what says, so oh, there's a big impact of transfer. You can do simulations with uh, nominal parameters, something like close one gigabyte and two microseconds. And you can compare these things and you can compare do simulations with different latencies and bandwidths. Ideals, ideal, and, and two, micro, two microseconds, for example. And by comparing these things, you can really get a feeling of what is actually more important in terms of the impact of bandwidth. And tells you, for example, what would be the behavior of your, these are two versions of an, of an application, what would be the impact of, for example, reducing the memory, the transfer bandwidth, the network bandwidth. And some of them is quite okay till this bandwidth. The other one is quite okay till this other bandwidth. And this this kind of insight is something that uh, I do believe is is very important. So I had a whole bunch of uh, of uh, slides. You have them about this thing. The, the material is also discussed in some of these links that I presented you before. So essentially, I, I will skip those presentations as of those, those slides as of now. And uh, just very briefly mention uh, the, the other things that we have in terms of tool that I mentioned. We have tools, we can have mechanisms, different mechanisms for, for tracing uh, with uh, kind of partial accuracy that lets you still obtain very good information of large runs or with large core counts. We have uh, mechanisms for doing analytics, as I said, you can actually apply clustering techniques to the data of, of each of these computational regions. You can describe it in the, instead of in the time and processor space, you can describe it in the, in the space of, for example, IPC instructions per cycle and, and instructions completed was the computational complexity of that region between two MPI calls. You can apply clustering techniques, identify them. You can feed that back into the trace file and you see the structure behavior of the of your application. And you can use this for very detailed uh, obtention of hardware counter metrics and the right metrics for, for each individual of those regions. 
We have mechanisms for doing things like out of a sporadically sampled uh, execution, obtain instantaneous, or almost instantaneous uh, evolution of metrics like MIPS or like, uh, I don't know, I have animations here, like uh, uh, stalls or what is the stall cost, the risk, the reorder buffer is, is the, is the the store buffer, what is the, the actual cost of the stall? So there's for detailed analysis of instantaneous functions of time, as well as tracking, what is the evolution? This is the clustering and at the given core count, what happens if I go to a double core count? Will everybody stay with the same IPC? Will everybody shift to the right, to the left? And we can apply tracking techniques and see how when increasing the core count, how this cluster moves and what is the trajectories? And actually you see that the cluster, which has very few instructions and very good IPC, is can, it will actually go through the roof when, if you keep increasing. So it's a, it's a bottleneck kind of predictive capabilities. And the final thing I wanted to comment is this part on the, this thing on the, on the right side part, where uh, you can also by this uh, mechanism of uh, sporadically sampling, you can actually also gather with uh, in on interplatforms with the peps mechanism you can actually gather, gather the memory access pattern and you can display things like uh, what is the memory address but not only what is the memory address here the color and codes the where did the data come from from the cache l1 cache from the l2 cache from the remote from a remote cache so this is the kind of detail analytics that you can that you can do of course, I, in terms of performance and the basic performance analysis, these things, uh, I would always recommend this methodological aspect that I have been describing as the first step of the analysis. But I don't know if there is people interested in looking at memory access pattern or people looking at the evolution of stall causes. These are the things that, that with these uh, features can be processed and can be visualized and displayed with, with it. Okay, with this, I will finish the second section, which was a long one. Maybe we can take a 10 minutes break and we continue at, uh, well, I don't know if there are other questions, but if not, we take at 11, 11 uh, 15, okay? And, and we will continue with the programming programming side and the, and the RISC-5 and the epi risc 5 side. Any question? Uh, I think in the slides uh, about OpenMP, in the slides I had the I had the reference to the OpenMP web page, and there is uh, there is uh, in the OpenMP web page you have not only the documentation but you have links to a book. I think there was uh, there was a book by oh, Gabriel Jost uh, who was uh, was interesting. So there, there you have the, the web page uh, for the OpenMP and you can, you can find it there, yes. Any other question? So let's uh, reconvene at quarter past. core of the presentation which was on the on the programming model and on, well more than programming model on the programming practices I would say and and the vision of what we consider are important approaches for for scaling for for large scale systems and and the first topic is is asynchrony asynchrony and overlap and and really this this trend uh, to, to kind of switch away or escape from, from, the, from the very bold synchronous type of approaches that, that we typically have, which end up being latency 
dominated. And, uh, and the actual message is, I, I would like to give is that uh, order is more important than overhead. And it is a message that probably, I mean, a lot of people is really very obsessed with overheads and they are important, yes, they are important. But uh, I would like to convey this feeling that uh, even more important than the order, ordering issues are even more important than, than that. And I would like to, to show, and I will do it just showing some examples and to develop a feeling that of, of, this, of this difference between our mental models of how machines behave and, and, and how they end up behaving in reality, okay? Uh, so it would be kind of uh, addressing these aspects and, and, and kind of suggesting how, how we, th I believe the, the, the thing should be, the system should be programmed in the future. So talking about synchronization, I, I've taken, I've put this very simple program. So you have a loop that computes for a certain amount of time and communicates. And I have put a barrier here and uh, have the same loop, but the barrier is outside of the outside of the of the of the loop. Which of those should be faster? By how much? Which effects would you expect these things to 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 happen to occur? What behaviors would you expect to occur? So I did this. I did trace this on an MPI run, and I got these two traces. Okay, remember how to read them. This is useful duration. This is the length of the computation. So I have a long computation region, dark blue, followed by, by a point-to-point -point communication. And the point-to-point, -point, what happens in the point-to-point -point is that you there is light blue, then light green, there is small communications. I mean, in, in MPI, when you communicate, typically you have to pack messages. You have to, so there is a little bit, or even just the, the time between the, the time between instruction, between MPI call and MPI call. There is a little bit of useful computation in there. And this is what is represented here. What are we getting? Probably, so you have compute communicate barrier. What we get, we get this barrier kind of effect, but one of the things that we get is sporadically, we get holes, okay? What do we get in the other one? This is the second the second trace file, the, the asynchronous, and this is the behavior that, that we get. Would, were we expecting to have also vertical lines of compute, communicate, compute, communicate, and in reality we see there are kind of these waves, this, so really the behavior is not totally that, that synchronous, it's, it's, it's asynchronous, and one of the things that happens in the synchronous one is there is an impact of noise, there's, there's noise, and the noise reflects in some of the computations being orange, being a little bit more than 450 microseconds, the, the blue ones are 450, so there are oral regions of computation that are larger than 450 microseconds. And there are regions of MPI that take more than the, than the standard time. Okay, and this is noise operating system noise. And that's the problem of very synchronous type of approaches or globally synchronous approaches where you have collective operations where you have to wait for everybody. And if one gets hurt by noise or by a preemption, by a small delay for any any reason i mean i don't know maybe the processor is is even doing i don't know internal checking of their its error correcting capabilities and for a few microseconds so very strange things can happen and the result is that uh, sporadically there are delays in one processor on one of them there are epsilon there is nothing but if you have a global synchronization mechanism if you hurt one of them, everybody feels the pain, okay? So this is a basic fundamental mechanism, fundamental behavior that, that appears on, on when you are doing global synchronization. That's why it's important to introduce asynchronous. There's another thing that I wanted to mention here. If we apply the models here, uh, so what would you expect? So the difference between those would be only on serialization or would be on transfer. If you look at it, uh, the fact that there is also a curious behavior, there's, there's not only impact on communication and stuff on serialization, which would be this, this, this kind of impact of noise or of transfer. There's a, there's a difference in the efficiencies that they all get, but there's also efficiencies in things like IPC. So there's kind of 
6% efficiency in, in IPC efficient. This guy gets better IPC. So we, we are talking about communication and there is the, the actual behavior on the system is actually having an impact on the behavior of the computational side. What I'm trying to just say is, insist that the method, the above method presented can give us very, can point us to things that we would not expect and that they end up happening. And, uh, and uh, the also thing of, of actual impact of noise and the actual fact that uh, asynchrony may end up in the, the dependencies being propagated through the chain in generating through the dependency chains generating this kind of wavy type of behavior, which you pay uh, at the end. But if you don't pay that, if you don't, at the collectives, if the global synchronization, if you don't put those many global synchronizations, you have overall the possibility of getting a better performance. And, but that includes also IPCs, okay? And if you think why IPC can potentially be better, maybe the application is memory bandwidth bound, here, when they are computing, they are all computing, so all of them memory bandwidth bound. When they are doing MPI, they are all doing MPI. Here, in this case, because of the asynchrony effect that appears, at some point in time, some of the processes in a node, this is multiple process, this is a single, I, I don't know, I think it's 90 something, so this is a couple of nodes. Uh, and not all the processes in the node are doing the same thing. So the effect ends up being that there is a more effective bandwidth, for example, for for individual threads. So these are things that uh, the model helps you observe. You can, if also given driven by the model, you can also really look at this thing and see, yes, they're slightly faster in the histogram. They are more to the left, slightly, very slightly, but sufficient to be noticeable. Of course, this behavior, this is what I presented here. This is what happened if, if the granularity is fine grain and the noise can be very important. If you increase the granularity, the impact of noise is less, the impact of communication was less, but still you always see this kind of, this kind of uh, wave, wavy type of, of behaviors. The other thing, next thing I wanted to, uh, next example was, uh, well, people say, okay, when I have to do asynchronous communication in MPI, what I do is non-blocking MPI calls. I do an iSense, I do then the weights and I separate them. The blocking communication is like doing them one after the other. So I do the iSense and I do the weights. This is kind of a blocking type of uh, structure and I don't try to overlap. So I, I do, the do the communication between these two calls. In when I try to overlap and what I do is I do the request for the communications, I do the computation and then I do the weight for those computations, for those communications. So theoretically I would expect this communication, which I issued here, which I initialized here to take place in parallel with the computation. What happens in reality? This is the trace of the, of the uh, blocking case. And this is a trace of the non-blocking. Not really that different. If you look at the, the time without, MP, without computing, so the type in MPI is the white, the black background color here is significant fraction. So, but this is still also a significant fraction of, of, the, of the time in, 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 in this execution. And I actually did my code refactoring with the main idea of trying to overlap and I didn't achieve it. So this is a situation which is very frequent. If you look at the, this is the MPI calls, you have blue, uh, this is computing, you have here the barriers, you immediately after that you have the the iSense and you have the, the weights. This corresponds to this case where you put them one after the other. But if you if you do the other approach, what has happened here? What has happened is, well, the order has changed. So it's after the after I, the weight is here, after the weight I do the barrier and after the barrier I do the, the their communication request for the other ones. But in fact, I have not achieved the real overlap. And this, what I'm trying to say is, this difference between what we think we are doing or we are getting and what we, we are really getting, which depends very often on, on the implementations of the MPI on the characteristic of the implementation is really potentially different. So I'm just arguing that introducing asynchrony is important, but it's important to first have a clear or perception of, of where to do it and some indications on, or whether it will be worthwhile or not. I did this with a fine granularity and if you have fine granularity, it's probably difficult for the, for the communication to overlap. 
and I will come up with alternatives. There are alternatives like establishing progression and gene threads, and I will look at that in a minute. So this is this is kind of the same thing, whether instead of putting the barrier inside each iteration, I put the barrier outside. And in reality, you see that uh, that essentially, even if you use blocking communications, you still see this, this wave kind of behaviors, but a, lit, a little bit worse, maybe in this, maybe in this case is a little bit better, but still a lot of holes and no real, no real overlap. So it would be nice to achieve real overlap in, in this, in these things. Okay. I mentioned the progression thread. People say, okay, the, the problem is that the problem is that when you when you do the I send, when you enter MPI, you are not checking the progress of the MPI communications. And so the actually the the the, the internal messages of MPI don't are not sent and they are not received and, and the data is actually not transferred. So you can activate the possibility of having an external progression thread, but you have also people having the experience and actually the recommendation in, of vendors or many cases not to use it because if you have fine granularity as here, you can really actually end up seeing pain because you end up having additional threads contending for the resources for the processors and their scheduling issues that, that you can have some pain. You can have some gain in some cases, right? But it's kind of the thing is that it's not totally natural. The model, the, the, the model we have, the mental model we have, and the actual behavior can potentially be uh, different. So this this was a situation with a, with a given granularity. This was uh, with a gran, let's say grain four. This is grain one, so it's, it's not an absolute number, but it's just to say finer granularity. And you can see that the pain can be significant sometimes, depending on granularity. It gets worse with finer granularities. And uh, still, very, very weird behaviors. These things happen if you have fine granularities. In reality, in this case, what happened is in the code I use, actually, after these point-to-point -point communications phases and after this loop that I, that I showed, I had several barriers and actually, came out that the barriers internally were really having very bad, very bad uh, performance for some reason. So what I'm trying to say is yes, it's important to look at, at uh, the, actual, the actual behavior, okay? This was just, just, just again, the same thing. The, the impact of can, can really be very painful. So, and, and essentially all of this happens because this lack of correlation between so if you use additional threads, these additional threads you are resources that are at the operating system level are, are, are contending for, for the CPUs and they may cause really uh, delays in, in other computation that may be in the critical in the critical path. So the message is it's important to achieve asynchrony. It's it's uh, we often have this mismatch because what we think we execute and and uh, and what we and what we actually get. And there is another issue that I wanted to mention here, which is there, there's a problem when trying to introduce asynchrony by using iSense and receives plus weights. And the problem is that we have to place the weights somewhere in the source code. And the question is, what is a good place? And, and it's not necessarily easy to, to address that or to answer that. There might be occasions where different places or, or would be better. So the, the comp actually, essentially where you put the weight, all the computation after that will have to wait for, will have to be delayed to, in, if that weight gets delayed. So, and, and maybe there are possibilities depending. So we have seen this noise. Sometimes the MPI is, does not always take the same amount of time. So it may end up that some communications in different iterations take different amount of time and, and just the comment. There is not really an easy way, a, an easy way to, to place those weights. So I will be arguing for the possibility or for the need to really analyze the behavior, look at the potentials, and, uh, and then try to have syntax to express those potential orders and maybe not only a fixed one, but many possible, multiple possible alternatives. And, and I want to do this with a, with an example, which is, uh, this is a trace that I got a long time ago for a, a weather code doing chemical transport, okay? 
and and this is the the functions the color represents the functions so there is a function here which happens to be done on all the processes and uh, the and the use the color and the color only in useful so if you see black is because uh, inside that function you were calling mpi so you were not doing useful computation but here look like everybody's doing useful computation but here you have kind of something like it looks like a, you are doing a loop of uh, green red brown green red brown green a, a loop of four of those things and more on some processors than others but these things end up being black and black here means inside mpi so not very useful not very efficient usage of of the of the of the computation here and and the question what i would like to, to think is can we think of possible refactorings of this rather than saying so may, maybe one of the outcomes would be the, the simplest outcome for people would be okay mpi a problem let me go and blame whoever is the MPI implementer, my vendor, okay? You guys have to do much better MPI because you see my program is very bad, okay? I, 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 would, I would not directly use this approach and this approach which is going directly, which is the function that takes more time or takes more un, un, unwanted time and, and blame that directly. I would like to do a little bit more of analysis. Uh, think of alternatives of potential impacts and potentials of refactoring. So it's kind of thinking of potentials. And if you think of what each of these individual processes is doing, and you don't need to, to have source code for that, okay? You just need, each of these individual processes is doing is doing some computation for a relatively long time. So I represent it by a computation. And after that looks like it's doing four, a sequence of, of four steps. Each of those steps has a green, which happens to have MPI inside it. Then it has a pink, which happens, seems not to have MPI, and a brown, which seems to have MPI. And, and if you start, when, what I would always suggest is think of, of the dependencies. What is the fundamental dependencies? Why this order was set up in the, in the original source code? Is it because all of these things need all of this data computed here? Or is it, and by the way, they are in order. So essentially what you have is after doing one of them, you have a dependence and you do the other one and then you do have a dependence and you do the other one. This is what seems to be seen from this, from this timeline, okay? And it's all, as I said, it's all speculating. I've not looked at the source code, but you think of, you look at potentials. And the question is, is it really like that, that everything needs the whole of this? Or is it something like this, that, this part needs the first part of this thing. The second green thing needs the second part of it. The third one needs the third part of it. And the question is, because if this was like that, is this, if this was like this, one could change the execution orders and would compute this thing first. And while you are doing the green thing, which happens to be not very efficient because it's using MPI and happens, while you do this green thing, you have the opportunity to execute this and this and this. All these things are not needed for this green, so you can advance the, the green, the green uh, computation. So is it like this or not? Is it, uh, is, can this thing be split or not? And, and, and this is the point where, uh, well, you may have evidences whether something can be split or not. For example, if this program you run with this number of threads and you run it with twice the number of threads and you see the same pattern, it means essentially fundamentally that this competition could be split into different parts. So the probability is very high that this can be split. I cannot guarantee because I've not seen the source code. I know, I don't know about the application itself. So, but maybe it's a point where as an analyst, I can talk to the, to the developer and say, okay, is this the case? Is this the situation really? Instead of these dependencies, do, we, do I have these dependencies? So these are potentials. Actually inside this one, actually, if that happens actually inside here, I would have actually possibility of splitting that into small. So I would be able to, to really split and exploit more, more processes. More, more cores, for example, I could use OpenMP, keeping the MPI part with a limited number of, of processes, but still doing the, the OpenMP part with, with more threads. And if there is no dependence between this thing and this thing, in reality, 
all of these competitions can be actually overlap on the other threads with with uh, with this communication and i can still keep this sequential ordering of these communications so again what i'm trying to show is what i think is an important way of thinking about the the way we structure our computations and the possibilities of refactoring because there may be other things is it really fundamental this dependence between these three or between so you have to finish this in order to start this or the dependency is something like that you only need these dependencies or in reality you can even not have any dependence at all you need once you compute this part you can start this thing and between them they have no interaction so this is the kind of thinking that would i think helps identifying potentials of improving over uh, common uh, performance and actually improving overlap okay and you have these potentials algorithmically you must be aware that the, you must be sure you must check with the developer that this or that this that these uh, dependencies are really like that but then the question then the question is is this one i have identified alternatives of ex different potential execution orders do i have a syntactic way to express those things without being very 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 explicit in terms of where i put the ascents or the weights or do i do a put uh, and, and and do I have a, a mechanism of expressing that which is really flexible and really adaptable? The actual execution order will be actually adapted to the to the execution to the execution conditions, and this is uh, what I think is an important mindset change that we should have is 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 forget about the specific hardware about the specific communication and think about what are the potential orders that our application uh, could uh, tolerate. And then the thing is, what is the syntax? And uh, what I'm defending, what I'm pushing for is this syntax being based on OpenMP. And, and well, OMS is a uh, line of program, a programming model we have been working at VSC, which uh, has been acting as kind of influencing OpenMP. But it's a task based. So the idea is task based. My, my, own, my point is to find that task based approaches are, are important. And the work that we did is, is kind of stay with the sequential and the suggestion is stay with the sequential program on a single address space that i'm talking within an mpi process okay with directionality annotation so you identify tasks you identify these potential things and and you put directionality annotations to kind of help the system to identify dependencies such that the X system is able to execute it in parallel so this is the basic idea. This is the kind of efforts and activities that we've been doing, kind of doing prototype implementations that we have tried to push into OpenMP. And some of them we have been successful and some of them we failed uh, miserably, but that's essentially about the research and and, and uh, we keep uh, working on, on some of these, some of these developments. But the fundamental idea I think has been well taken by by OpenMP and the mechanisms of tasks and dependencies are, are there. And the one important thing from my point of view is that this is a single mechanism, this annotation of what I use inside my task. What is the data that I use? This is very old syntax of um, OpenMP. So uh, what I use inside the task and what I produce inside the task, this information is a single mechanism that is able, it allows the, the, the runtime to detect concurrency and to detect potential parallelism by actually going through this execution. And instead of actually executing the task themselves, building a dependence graph with them and, and letting other threads in your same process go behind the main thread and, and go taking those tasks as they become free of dependencies and the previous ones predecessors are executed and uh, being able to uh, to really get a, a huge look ahead because the main program goes and goes and goes and goes into the future and well this is a situation where we can see the future and, and see in the future has some advantages okay some possibilities of exploitation if you, if you can if you can uh, see it so this is a mechanism that lets you do that but it's also a mechanism that because you are basing that on what is the data that I used in out and in out data, it's also a mechanism that if the runtime is smart enough, it's a mechanism that helps the runtime, lets the runtime manage the, the data, the, the, the data transfer, the other space. 
In fact, this example I have here, we were running this on, on this was a sequ single sequential code long time ago, very long time ago, running on, on with this task, we had the uh, GPU ver kernel CUDA versions for this task, and it was same source code was running on a single GPU, was running on two GPUs, was running also, it was uh, really a, a kind of uniform kind of way of homogenizing the heterogeneity that I've said. So you have a single algorithm, which is understandable to a numerical analyst, has no details of the platform. We have to forget about the platform in terms of writing the program, and it still lets the runtime to do this. This management of data, moving data, so no explicit data of movement by the application, the runtime moving the data, and, and being able to run on one or several applications, on several GPUs, and actually giving opportunities to improve the, the scheduling by the, by the runtime. So OpenMP does support us a little bit, uh, even some of these mechanisms uh, without dependencies with the idea of supporting unstructured loops. You have the, again, the OpenMP, the OpenMP reference here. You have, uh, as we said, these books on reference to the books. You have also tutorials that are given at different supercomputings. For example, you have material there. So you have the mechanism for spawning tasks. You have task loop control to, to actually Split the loop into multiple tasks of a given size. You have nesting. There are, there are a whole bunch of, of characteristics. I think many of these are, are important. In, in fact, these dependence mechanisms that we were proposing has been taken. The syntax is just like the, this is the OpenMP syntax. And, and you can do that, uh, that thing of building those dependencies graphs, looking into the future, and being able to schedule the runtime to schedule the execution of, of tasks. Uh, there are features like uh, variable uh, multi-dependencies, the changing different number of iterations of, of uh, dependencies for the same syntactic construct. So there's a whole bunch of features there, which I think are interesting and is a relatively uh, flexible mechanism to express those potentials that I uh, expressed before that, that, uh, that we identified. Well, just to mention, there are things that we did in open in OMS that didn't make it into OpenMP, at least not for the moment. And then it was curious because some of the features that we proposed, uh, uh, the first proposal to OpenMP, the answer was no way. And and then later, some years later, they actually uh, and the actual propose uh, they are actually already today in the standard. So it's it's a curious situation. One never knows how will the whole thing. Uh, Evolve. So what I want to say here, we have some features that uh, that are not in the standard. It's a full dependence analysis of the regions. Very so it's, it's, it has a more overhead, but it has a huge potential with that for the programmers to write very simple codes and and very flexible execution orders and very high levels of of overlap between between iterations. I, I've presented before about this uh, homogenizing heterogeneity. I think this is very important, okay? The, and heterogeneity the, it has different aspects. It has an aspect of performance heterogeneity. You have heard of big little. And these task-based models, for example, let you <coughs> play with the scheduling policies that would try to use both big and little processors if you have a platform which has that. You have another aspect, which is ISA heterogeneity. You have to actually to pack different binaries, compile code from one device, compile for the other, and pack that. And, but that's not uh, not so much of a problem in itself. I think the more fundamental problem is this uh, this fact that they that uh, many of the heterogeneous devices here have non-coherent address spaces. And and uh, as I said before, our proposal was to, to have mechanisms for the compiler and runtime to hide all of that. This is, for example, not the direction that has been taken, for example, by OpenMP. So it's more like a, a bit kudish in that, from that point of view, or a bit open, open ACC ish. But, uh, but uh, this handling of this non-coherent other space is, is, uh, is an issue. I'm not going to talk much more about that. Yes, I, I heard in some of the profiles that people have been doing FPGAs, uh, been using FPGAs. We have people, you can have OMS at FPGA, which essentially means that you have still write this sequential source code with us, this Cholesky code with us. And instead of providing a CUDA kernel for the for the DGMs or the for the factorizations, you provide uh, an FPGA kernel, 
and the FPGA can you can program it in in HLS or things like that. So there's we have frameworks for doing this. If somebody's interested and can further research, I can give pointers. What I what I had here were some examples of the asynchrony. Um, probably running a little bit late on time. Maybe I can show only some one some of those. Uh, Maybe a comment here, for example, this was an example of a code which had four loops one after the other. And, and this is a very typical situation. You say, okay, I'm very optimistic. I'm going to put OpenMP or thread level parallelism and I paralyze this loop. Good. I paralyze this loop. Good. I paralyze this loop. By now I'm fed up, I'm tired, or maybe this one is more difficult to paralyze. I don't, I, I cannot or I don't want to paralyze. What will be the behavior in a standard in OpenMP behavior? Will be something like this. This will be paralyzed, this other also, this other also, but this will be serialized and you will be throwing away course. What happens with this task-based uh, approach is that you maybe this one is not dependent on the other ones. So if it's not dependent, you don't need to paralyze it. Don't paralyze it. Just at the outer level, spawn this as one task, this another, this another, and this another. Paralyze internally the first three, but just, I don't know, maybe give priority to this one and tell the runtime. So this is this osmotic membrane. It's small information like give priorities and in the runtime, please try to start this as soon as possible because I know it's going to be long and I don't want to paralyze it. And this was the example how this was. So this is a mock-up. This was a trace of a real run on a real code, how this was achieved, okay? I have uh, other uh, examples uh, that this asynchrony is not only something for the for the HPC side of world, but this is a standard, let's say, file processing. You read the file, you feel, process it, you, you read a, a bunch of a, a part of the of the file, you process the block, and you write the result of the process of that processing. And this reading, typically, the reading is, has, I mean, it's, yeah, this is just Unix, Linux, okay? So this is sequential dependence. You have to read sequentially. You could process, and actually this depends from the read, but actually you could, uh, if you could advance this many times, you could actually have many of these in parallel. And here you have, again, a sequential dependence. So the question is, how do you write, the, write this code, which has a loop, which has a read, the process, and the write and some other additional computations. So the idea is that with these annotations of the task, you could actually keep these dependencies between this task, dependencies between this task, so that there will never be a white a read, two reads at the same time. There will never be two writes at the same time, but there can be several reads and writes. So this is the syn. Sorry, there are several processing. This is a syntax. Uh, this is in, in our original code. It was without uh, many of these malloc's. I in 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 SMP superscalar because actually the thing in, in order to obtain parallelism here you can use uh, you can use re, uh, renaming and you actually uh, did it. Uh, we actually did it automatically at that point in time. This syntax is with the current OpenMP uh, OMS open uh, approach where you have to do a little bit of of allocation of buffer of management of buffers, but it's a minimal one. The result is something that is like that, which essentially, if you look at it, you never see two whites at the same time. You never see two reds at the same time. You see overlap between whites and reds. You see several blues at the same time, but you see this is the duration of the reads and uh, of the of the IO operations. These are IO operations. They can be some of them very fast, some of them very slow. So you really see that. It's a way of very dynamically adapting to the actual behavior of a system, okay? So I think this is a good example to show that asyn asynchrony is a very important thing that can, otherwise you would have the read, you could, you could paralyze the, the blue internally. And this is here, the blues are executed sequentially. Each of them is a full, is a full processing of, of the full buffer, okay? So we are actually having coarser granularity which means less overheads, okay. And I have another example, which is about uh, a code from uh, Outreach in this case, a mini app, which uh, essentially has a skeleton like this, three nested loops with this kind of operations. This one thing is this operation is in some cases for some index values is very, very, very expensive. In some others is very, very cheap. 
So it's a kind of a sparsity in the matrix. So there, there, there are these differences. So the question is, how do you parallelize this? If you just open MP and you parallelize the outer loop, or you parallelize the next one, or you parallelize the next one, if you parallelize one of the loops, you end up having that because there are some of those tasks that are extremely expensive, you end up having this, this huge serialization, okay? So what we did for parallelizing with the task-based code, uh, task-based approach, this is, this is the situation. There is a potential dependence between, between uh, successive ones. And in reality, there are different guys. So essentially we have different chains of dependencies between tasks. Sometimes the, ta the task is fine grain, sometimes the task is coarse grain, but you have some dependency chains. But the only thing is you have a parallelism, which is only I, is the, the, the number that if, the degree of parallelism. This is probably not enough as degree of parallelism. Can we exploit the fact that these things are more expensive so in some cases? And so can what if we su substitute this code? So we do a minimal code refactoring, substitute this code by something like this, where we do the operations into a temporary array and then the temporary array into the, we do the reduction into the final array. And the, the reduction is something which has the dependencies but the temporary array has no dependencies As in, because you can have multiple temporary arrays in reality you can well you have uh, you can handle them as a circular buffer of, of temporary arrays and you have a, a one antidependence depends that depends on the size of the of these temporary arrays but it's, it's a rel still modified it's a refactor code but still relatively simple refactoring rather than throwing away the whole code or rather than start doing a huge amount of transformations. We still we can still do things like uh, conditionals for for um, what if the tasks are small in that case we don't probably don't want to split them so there are some kind of optimization that each of those introduce a little bit more of refactor code and Ideally, it would be nice to, to have as little as possible of this, okay? But, uh, but we can write the code, which is still, is still reasonable. What is the task graph of that code? And this up being like that, because essentially this, these things are essentially independent between each other. As long as you have a temporary buffer where to stop that, they are totally independent. So you have the I dependence change here of the reductions, but you have a huge amount of long, expensive operations to be executed. This is the thing that uh, we said can result in, in a fast, far better behavior than the original ones that we showed with MPI. But still interesting, we observe still interesting dependence, still interesting kind of pulsations of amount of instantaneous parallelism that could be supported that have to do with the level, with the distance of this, of this, uh, of this uh, renaming kind of anti-dependencies and can be also improved by playing with priorities. So this is the thing, for example, explicitly controlling the whole thing with explicit source code, user level source code is, is would be a nightmare. Just playing with this uh, osmotic membrane, things like the, like the priorities is really uh, something that would let you do a, a really very much, much, much better than the, than the original performance, okay? So, this is uh, this was the comment, and so, yeah, it would actually certainly be interesting to have syntax that would let you get the same effects without having to play with what we did here of some some additional conditionals or some additional temporary arrays. What happens uh, with hybrid? Uh, so all of that is about inside the MPI process. Okay, what happens with hybrid code? This is the typical stuff, the typical situation for people who are running uh, MPI plus OpenMP. You have the typical MPI code, compute, communicate, maybe synchronize, global synchronization or not. But when you want to have MPI, OpenMP, what you have is the, the, the compute thing, you parallelize it with whatever, okay? And this is the impact. It does have an, an, an overhead. It does increase, remember, before we had this uh, impact of noise, it's getting things a little bit worse in terms of noise. From here to here is not getting a perfect speed up. So these are the kind of things that, that, that people experience and having to do with locality or having to do. One of the things it certainly has to do is with the fact that if this is the computation with one thread 
this is with one thread. If you parallelize it, you split it into two parts, this one and this one, right? They, the parallel efficiency at OpenMP level because of cast things, for example, may or may not be ideal. The one thing that is for sure is that the, the MPA part, you are only paralyzing the OpenMP part, the MPA part stays the same and it stays and it starts being a real, a real bottleneck. Okay. We have this efficiency model that I presented for pure MPI. You have the same kind of thing for MPI plus OpenMP where we try to blame uh, and do a global efficiency model. What, what is the global efficiency, the global load balance, considering all threads, what is the global load balance? What is the global IPC? And you can do it kind of uh, hierarchically at the level of, if we only consider the MPI side, side of the thing, or we only consider the open MP side of the thing. And, and this can help us identify, I don't know, do we have to hire an MPI expert or an open MP expert for, for improving the efficiency of our MPI plus open MP application. So this kind of separates the blame into the, the region, which is more really more, more important. So the model works, just a few more comments about taskifying communications, which is um, the hope or the, the, well, the observed behavior is, which it makes things different on a task-based approach compared to the purely uh, uh, traditional MPI plus OpenMP, which only parallels the computation is that this task-based approach can propagate the asynchrony features that we have seen in the examples, for example, the outreach application can propagate these asynchrony features to the global program behavior without actually in reality, without really needing to change MPI or need, okay. We can have things like this, okay. We can have, we can taskify at the outer level, the communication and assign all the communications to one task and do the computations in the main thread. So this is what we are seeing here. At this point in time, we spawn one task, which does the MPI communication. This is the task ID. We spawn one task, it does all the MPI communications, that's all these things plus all these things, okay? So these are the MPI calls, these are the useful computations. We spawn this task, which does that, and we do the compute in the master thread, okay? In this way, what we have achieved compared to the original version, what we have achieved is that the computation and the communication are executed in parallel, okay, between them. And they are overlapped. And this is only needed, only needs this thing and this task weight. Uh, we identified that there is a little bit of imbalance, okay? At this point in time, the communication takes less, so we, we have a little bit of imbalance. What can we do? We can now parallelize this thing and the behavior will be during the initial part, you will have one thread doing the MPI communications and the other doing the, the part of this computation. But when the MPI communication finishes, the thread will go and help with the rest of this computation that is missing. So this is the kind of things that you can, how you can actually propagate the asynchrony to the outer level, okay? We have behaviors with different core counts it actually makes you be less sensitive to these perturbations also. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an important activity, an important way to approach parallelization of codes, looking at a little bit coarser granularity level and, and taskifying and overlapping communication and computation. Uh, it has a much more potential of overlap and auto further execution. And this is what I believe should be the way we should approach uh, systems in the future. Um, some issues. Uh, there is uh, one issue which is uh, if you have several concurrent MPI calls, you may need a thread safe MPI and the thread safe may, may MPI may be a little bit less efficient. Uh, the MPI in itself is a two serial programming model. There are dependencies between, uh, so matching semantics which have Im implications into the into this this the orders that's not allowed for any or for for any reordering the internal mpi state is also shared state so it actually means from if you have to do this certification you may have to clone uh, to clone uh, communicators for example and if you spend have many tasks inside mpi you may be wasting course this is not so much of a problem now but the main problem is that if you have blocking calls and a limited number of physical threads it might end up having 
you may end up having deadlock depending on the order. And this is a real problem. So alternatives for this problem is essentially, let me skip it. I mean, if you keep the order of execution of MPI, so in the example that we had before, all the MPI was with respect to itself, not with respect to computation, but with respect to itself, it was keeping the sequential order. You may lose a little bit of, of concur potential concurrency, but you ensure there is no deadlock. The other alternative is kind of virtualize this communication resource. And what we have done here, we have is an MP, a Tampi library, Tampi, which virtualizes the, the, the communication, which mean, essentially means what it essentially does is when one task gets to do an MPI call, which is blocking MPI call, the scheduler decides to block that MPI call, that MPI, that thread, and run a new thread with a, a or, so, or run a new task or a new compute task on this same on this same core. Okay, playing with this coordination of scheduling between the open MPI and open MP, you can essentially virtualize and essentially implement as if you had infinite number of potential MPI task calling MPI, and you end up being uh, being able to overlap this this communication and computation. You may have some references for these things here. I'm not going to go into into the details, into the details of, of that. The final thing that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, programming model stuff is this malleability. And, and the, the reason is, uh, as I, I already said, we really don't know what will be the demands of, of, of the load on the system, what will be the availabilities, what is the perf actual performance achieved by the different resources. And, and and it's kind of a lost battle. We have to learn to live. We have to learn to adapt. This thing of saying, I ask for a hundred processors and I want all of them at this frequency. And this is something that, well, I mean, we can keep doing that, but it's going to be able to result in, in very big losses of global performance. And we must learn how to how to adapt, okay? Be, be adaptable. And, and this is a matter that the application has to be able to sometimes run with more resources, sometimes shrink, sometimes expand, and dynamically, okay? This is a, a matter that what I'm meaning by malleability. We have to do that with, uh, with programming model support, of course. If you look at, for example, from this point of view, pure MPI, MPI is not very malleable, right? And you start an application with 1,000 processes, period. I mean, there's people doing but but it's, it's very expensive. You have to kind of maybe shut down the application, restart the game, save the state. So it's it's very, very expensive. With OpenMP, with op the native OpenMP and these kind of things in the original OpenMP, these kind of things in OpenMP, these are very bad things from my point of view. So in the same way that I support OpenMP a lot, I, I, I do consider that there are some things which are legacies which should be because they actually, what they essentially mean is that when you open a parallel, you have to stay with that number of resources for the whole execution of the parallel. And, and, and really it would be much better if you are able to, to, to dynamically change and shrink the number of resources. So it's, this thing is something that's supported by OpenMP. You have to avoid some, some practices. So then the idea is to have runtime libraries or resource managers that are able to synchronize the different levels of the, of the programming model. And, and the easiest one to play, of course, as we said, MPI is not very malleable. So the easiest one to play is, is with the open MP number of threads, okay? And, and the idea is to, uh, what I presented here is to, if uh, the a process in a given moment is, uh, is executed in a part which is sequential, why not give away its additional threads to another process? This other process can advance more and maybe at some point later he will be actually give, return you these extra, some additional extra resources. Of course, if you need them, you can recover them. So this is the, the an idea of Within the within a node, all the processes in the node really share all the cores and try to maximize the throughput that you get. Okay, this is a library that we have we make uh, available in our website, and just to see how it behaves on on different applications and its ways of of reducing or improving 
the load balance of the application. With a good thing is if the application has frequent control points, frequent parallels for joins, for example, even, even for joins, but certainly more, much better with that. Uh, if it, 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 without really modifying the source code of the application, you achieve for free this load balancing within the node, okay? Examples with other different applications on how the number of processes source devoted to one application grows and sinks. And, and just to say that it's, uh, I believe it's a very important or very positive way of, of going to the, to, to the large, uh, throughput to the large scale. Essentially, I mean, there are some side effects. I mean, it's very interesting. You see, if you have a pure MPI application, which has M or has M imbalanced problems at MPI level, you don't need to parallelize it with OpenMP everywhere. You only need to parallelize with OpenMP the region which has MPI imbalances. The other, and you start the whole thing with N, with uh, filling the full node with processes, and, and uh, the dynamic load balancing mechanism only enters when some process blocks because it has not work to do and, held and, and, and lends its processor to the other one. So it's, it's, it's a kind of an incremental way to achieve good load balance without having to restructure the whole application at the level of MPI, which is a little bit of a nightmare in many cases. So, well, that DLB is the mechanism, the routine that we have. It's also good for reaction to noise. I'm going to, to finish on this part because I want to shift to the, to the EP side. Just DROM is a kind of coarser grain mechanism to achieve, library to achieve the same thing uh, with a more long-term type of view. So DLB is a fine grain granularities of a tens of microseconds drum is with granularities of milliseconds, but you can actually have these dynamics allocations of resources, which I think is, is important, is going to be important. Today we have many applications there in the parallel part, they use the whole thing, but then they have input or output parts where, and you in, in, in HPC centers, you keep with all the resources allocated and that's losing a lot of effort. So having said that, I'm going to uh, proceed through the next part of uh, the third part of the of the presentation, which is talk about the the RIS five vector processor within the EPI project. What's been developed and a little bit of alternatives and and opinions. I don't know. I, I I don't know if there is any just before that. Is there any other any question about the the programming model side or the this task based position, plenty of them. Hi, yes, hello. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. So uh, regarding the, the load, dynamic load balancing, yes. so it's correct that this method you, uh, you just showed works if you have multiple MPI processes, all which are assigned multiple OpenMP processes. Is that correct? Is that what's going on? So the, the idea is to have multiple MPI processes inside one node, because mm -hmm. it's a mechanism where you can only shift processors between processes in the same node. So this is this is a requirement, and but actually it's a, a recommendation I would make always. Uh, the MPI processes have to have open MP, whether they, you run them with multiple or with only one, uh, it's uh, you can run it the way you like it. But the, the, actually, the mechanism essentially adapts the number. Essentially, what I'm actually saying is you can run it if you have the mechanism activated. You can say I want to run this with uh, four processes per four threads, four cores per process. And essentially, what the what the system does is well, good thanks that you told me, but I'm going to run with the number of threads that I want each of these processors, each of these processes. And actually, whenever I detect somebody is going to is, is not doing anything, I'm going to give that process that core to the to another. I don't know if I explain it myself, but the thing is, the source code has to be MPI plus OpenMP. Doesn't need to be OpenMP everywhere. You don't have under law is a very bad message. You have to parallelize with OpenMP everything in order to fully use the system. This is under law. This is kind of a way of breaking under law. You, mm -hmm. you don't need to paralyze everything you, with OpenMP, just the things that have imbalance. Okay, that's clear. 
And then uh, if I could ask a follow-up question, how is there any methods for then uh, extending this to multi-node? So what if there's imbalance between nodes and not necessarily inside a single node? This mechanism does not very good because it relies on on sharing the same address space. So when you execute, is everybody can load and store from the same from the same from the same address space. Okay, you would be able to do something like that if you had a, a kind of a DSM or Pigash's implementation of the OpenMP, let's say. And we have we have. We have a uh, OMS at cluster, which is an implementation which has that, which has uh, one single process in two or three or four nodes. And in that case, you can do it, right? Uh, as a production thing for production codes, I would not recommend it today, but I think it has potential it's still under development and it could be used. It has potential, but uh, it's not something stable for, for production. But the, in that case, yes, you could, you could do it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, great. So actually, uh, I also typed my question on chatbot. Yes. So uh, I, I'm not familiar with the power programming, so my question might be strange. Uh, what I would like to know is you showed uh, uh, to tracing or checking the performance of the parallel uh, process uh, but by using the, the colorful graph like a, like a matching uh, between the your, your coding uh, path and the, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the graph uh, so how, how about in a, in a practically so in in, in practically uh, the parallel process might be complex to trace uh, for example some of the process uh, might be very long and so so my, my uh, what, what I want to know is how how to how to make a decision to do you know uh, that this approach is uh, better than you know, that approach or something like that. I mean I mean to, to I, get the over, overview yeah over performance. Yeah, and and probably probably you are you are interested in looking at, at uh, let's say workflows where you run uh, multiple jobs for for long times on on, on large resources. Okay. Right, right, right. So. so the, how, how to translate the graph? Yeah, how how do yes? Yeah. So the uh, probably tomorrow you will see an example of, of applying the at, at level of computational workflows using the tools. So uh, with uh, with Rosabadia with Pycons, the thing is uh, what I've presented is mostly looking at the internal internally one of the tasks in this one of the comp the jobs in this in this workflow is analyzing this fine grain very fine grain. Oh. Of, okay, this is what I've been applying. The tool itself and, and the concepts that I, uh, I have explained about, uh, about uh, parallelizing and taskifying, and these kind of concepts are, from my point of view, are about the same. Is what I explained before about this holistic co-design stuff. The same fundamental concepts apply at all levels. If you want to obtain traces, uh, Rosa will show prob probably, I guess, that you have and that you can have traces at this workflow level, but then the, the only the, the the trick is 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 you have to select the level at which you trace information, and the internal fine grain information aggregated much 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 more. Okay, so you would have to to do it that way. A direct usage of this tool the, and these examples and this extra package that I mentioned on the kind of uh, large computational workflows that you, I think you are interested in, a direct usage would not be the right way, okay? But uh, you can have uh, other kind of instrumentations as, as Rosa will show you. And, and, and the visualizer is about the same. And the concepts about parallelizing and taskifying from my point of view are and should be about the same, right? I don't know if it's, it's uh, totally clear. So that would be the approach to handle it as of today. I cannot tell you go download this and and well you can download Py Pycoms yes but but for a more other general framework or other frameworks or other workflow environments uh, we don't have that could be developed I see but we don't have it 
I see. Maybe we might focus on a, a part of the process and go deeply. Maybe what I understand. But 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 you are right. I mean, there sometimes what I've shown is sometimes you lose efficiency and you throw away something. You throw processors to the trash. You you don't use them at the fine grain microscopic behavior. Sometimes you do uh -huh. it in here inside the application. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes you throw them away at the macroscopic uh, level, so that that and and uh, being able to so for example, if you look at it, this trace is a specific case where you have for both uh, both applications. The the first application uses these threads at this point in time. This application does not use this core, which is yeah. now used by this other application. You can yeah. you can do some of these things, okay. Uh, the only thing is, uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you are interested in a specific case, might be, in, I mean, might be a matter of discussing actually which level of granularity of instrumentation inside and which level of granularity of team instrumentation outside, and whether we have available or not the instrumentation outside. Inside, typically, we should have available is what I have explained, but outside is a little bit more more uh, specific. There are many frameworks, many environments, and we may not. You might require to instrument them specifically, and we have not. Okay, but the yeah, tools and the mechanisms. Yeah. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. If there is no more question, and I have these forty-five minutes for this, for this part, I will talk a little bit about the the RIS, the EP project, and the RIS five vector processor, not about the whole uh, IP project, but uh, some some of the things that I'm mostly interested in. Hope they are also interesting for you. Uh, well, this was just to mention, for example, long time ago, some time ago, BSC was involved in this thing of trying to push ARM into the, in or embedded devices at that point was ARM into the, into the HPC into the HPC in arena. Now this EPI is, is actually in actually implementing implementing processors and trying to see how how uh, in my case, in this case, how vector processor, how the RISC V architecture can be used and can be can be exploited for, for high performance computing. So it's a, it's, it's actually is there the main, the original targets or origin motivations for both of them were more probably more in embedded type of thing. ARM has a certainly evolved towards uh, HPC and uh, and RIS-5, we tried to push it and I think we will. And, and this was a project set up by the European Commission and this project was kind of a, a combined ARM and RIS-5 vector to develop a processor, microprocessor technologies and on one side, uh, the ARM had to be could be licensed, and the RIS five stuff was something that could be actually developed from scratch. So it was actually supporting something where both ARM and RIS five could be used and combined to address a very wide range of of applications and domains. And it's a little bit. This is a little bit the feeling I had. This is from this comic from from Mafalda. So it's a little bit if you. And, and, but it's the the situation that when you design the system, you have is. You have to think of everything. You have to try and make a global picture of, of how things match with each other and how they how they interact. And it's probably not that, that not that easy. Okay. But we are trying to do a little bit of that. Okay. And actually the project there are kind of these three streams. There's a general purpose stream where actually they try to build an ARM, an ARM SBE, as we said, the evolution from ARM towards the vector side. So there are commonalities between the two, but this is the ARM SB and now Bull, which uh, is a system integrator, it was evolving towards chip integrator. At the end, they set up a spin off and Cyperl is the company who is actually doing this actual development of an ARM based chip by licensing ARM technology. On the accelerator side, and with a, maybe a more long term vision from, from the exploitation point of view, but the idea was to develop RIS 5 technology from scratch by combining technology and, and know how and and uh, contributions from from different partners of uh, of uh, in the project, and with the willingness to apply to to the automotive sector also. At the end, the architecture ended up ends up being kind of main and main ARM-based cluster using ARM 
uh, structure and license uh, technologies with the idea of putting in here uh, the experimental one tile of experimental RIS-5 uh, accelerator, which we call EPAC. And I will be talking mostly about this thing and actually not even not even only about this, but even only a part of this of this EPAC. With this kind of vision, trying to show and demonstrate that there is something interesting in this RIS-5 version. So let me skip a little bit those very philosophical stuff and tell you a little bit about what is the architecture of one of these tiles that was to be put in there. And you remember yesterday, uh, Rujes Pasa telling you about the uh, Avispado and Avispado, this is this RIS-5 core here. This is the overall mock-up of, of the kind of architecture there's of, of what the node is. And in the node, we have an Avispado, which is the, the scalar core with a vector with a vector unit. The vector unit has eight lanes and, and the whole thing supports kind of eight, uh, so uh, sorry, vector length instruction, eight lanes, but the vector length supported by the ISA is 256, okay? So this is has to do a little bit with the philosophical things that I expressed before about, about granularities at each level. And, and so it's, it's a little bit like that. So it's, it's a kind of a vector core, a vector processor, let's say, with this, the Avispado core and the, and the eight lanes, uh, but with a 256 vector lens. So we can put eight of those into a NOC connected to a, to a, share, to a share cache, L2 cache. And this is one part of the of the of the of the tile of the architecture. There's another part which is, in this case, is, is mostly ETH and and Bologna and Fraunhofer, which are actually doing and evolving the kind of developments what what Luca probably presented to you uh, yesterday. Okay, there the idea is to plug both things together in the same in the same uh, design in the same RTL. And the idea is that it should be put in Linux and it should be connected to the to the ARM world in the in the general case. Or what we are doing is a test chip, which is where, where this thing is actually connected to an external FPGA, which actually does the chip does not have. Uh, if you look at it, the, the peripherals actually has minimum has not even memory memory access memory controller kind of thing. So there's just a service to an external FPGA which implements the the this connectivity functionality so that's the the basic alternative and actually you heard from luca for these parts uh, i'm only mostly interested in going to talk to you about this vector vector side but a little bit following the philosophy that i expressed about uh, trying to recover with vectors um uh, this this raising the, the semantic level of of this isa level trying to minimize the the leakage that we have here of course leverage on top all the open mp ohms kind of stuff at the at the runtime and system software level but this vector i think is an important thing and, and with the idea that and and, and it, in a sense it matches if you see what uh, what Bill Nally was presenting yesterday about the additional instructions, the additional instructions that raise the semantic level that are tensor kind of operations that raise semantic level, which essentially do this to this less words, less instructions, more work. Okay, this this is the kind of uh, issue. One thing that for me is very important is is to highlight the importance of the ISA to do all of these things and to offer this under under a clean elegant isa which i think the risk five is, is a good, very good example is is more is, is different to this other way of approaching accelerators like devices that you have to program as not, not part not integrated within the within the the core itself and not integrated let's say under the control of the of the let's say the local scoreboards that you may have inside the processor. So I think this is a very important feature, and this is what we try to do in this low vector thing. And one important of the vectors is this fact that, I mean, uh, you decouple the front end and you, you you reduce the pressure. This was mentioned yesterday. You reduce the pressure on the front end, and you have this throughput orientation. Because if not, if you think on on um, and and this from my point of view is an issue with. With the uh, with I don't know with uh, with both Intel and even with ARM with uh, with Fuji, the, the the SV and um, these these systems where the the bandwidth of the front end 
and the bandwidth of the front and the and the back end is, is is kind of the same. If you imagine the 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 life of the front end of the Intel or of the SB, I mean to me it's, it's a very tough life. It's a very latency dominated life. You have to you have to hurry and hurry and hurry to feed the feed the piece that you have behind because every you have to give it the, the food in small pieces. You give it one one instruction, take only one cycle to execute. In this case, in this case, you give it one instruction, eight lanes, you have 256 vector length, takes 32 cycles to execute. So you free the front end from, from a lot of pressure. Okay. So we are, we actually think there are some levels of out of order execution that are also important. And in our case, it's more a, a decoupling between the scalar processor and the and the and the vector unit. And this this kind of osmotic membrane where the long the, the ISA, this ISA is kind of a mechanism to convey from the applications to the hardware information, but without having the applications or the runtime control exactly everything of how the hardware does things. So it's just to say that it's a little bit all these philosophical type of considerations that actually influence the, the development. It's current situation, there is a test chip taped out. I will comment a little bit about that. We have LLVM and Linux, and we have some SDBs where we can actually develop applications and try to analyze and evaluate application. And I will be talking very briefly about these things. So the test chip is, is, is just that this chip has actually this is what is in the chip. There are four tiles, which include the vector processor unit. So the core, the Avispado core plus the vector processor unit and the home and the cache and a cache block, a cache uh, module. So there are four of those. They have a crossbar uh, a network between them, which also connects. And they, they are the ESTX tiles from, from ETH, uh, extended with Fraunhofer additions here and uh, again connected to the to the tile there's plus some additional logic essentially how this looks like is like this this is the avispado plus the vector unit plus the home node and this is there are four of those there's the there's the the stx the two the two regions this actually this and this some additional logic there's there's a word by by ca on variable precision. So it's the, rather than following the direction that everybody, more, most of the people goes of shrinking the, the data type width, this is going for some numerical cases, you may want actually to increase it. And this is a variable precision arithmetic. And then you have the connectivity to the external FPGA, okay? And internally, you see here a little bit, a little bit more about the L2 cache that we have on each of those. You see the register banks. And if you, we told you eight lanes, registers uh, and this is one of the philosophical i think feel important philosophical things it's, it's a lot of state in registers the 256 elements so, so it's uh, we end up having something like 80 k's of of state in each of these register banks so it's a philosophy change and by the way there is well there is a small share uh, a small cache per for the scalar core as Arugi was presenting but there is not a, an l1 cache on at the level of of the vector unit. So this is the ATH stuff, and this is the, the FPGA designed to connect to the external to the external world. This is the work by fourth. I mean the fourth is doing very good work on also on, on this as well as on the internal design of, of the thing. Anyhow, my, my point was this is kind of a the whole, if you think of the whole API is kind of a very highly heterogeneous hierarchical system. Okay. You had the arms, the GPPs. Okay, and you had external memory, and in the design, even the the EPAC accelerator had no access to memory; had to go through the bridge to, through through this mechanism. But then you have uh, just the local cache, and you have the vector core that we say the, the vector is five vector, and you have the 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 STX mechanisms from from ETH where you have DMA. So this is the fundamental philosophical difference between these two stuff. Okay, this is. Here is load stores, and it's a little bit what Ruggie mentioned uh, yesterday that the load store performed the data transfer from the L2 or from external to, to the state here. And in the STX, it's more a traditional accelerator type of stuff where you have uh, separate memory addresses, you have your local state, and then you have to do explicit DMA transfers 
between between the, the two layers. And the chip actually combines the two types of hardware to do also experimenting and actually to support this very very hierarchical multi-level kind of kind of uh, heterogeneity. Okay. So my major focus is on what is the programming environment for such an environment for such a platform and what I would I like to what, what we, we propose and we promote and essentially is, is this thing of uh, MPI plus open MP is what I've been saying is, is a throughput type. So try to leverage all this uh, task based and MPI plus open MP interoperability that I've explained, try to leverage the malleability stuff that I have I have explained. So this, I think that this operate at the system level at the, the multi-core multi -core type of approach, this is kind of needed. Uh, as I said, the, the mechanisms in the with the directionality clauses and um, can actually allow the the runtimes the the runtimes to or, or the hardware to to manage memory and 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 we have produced introducing the hardware some support to to um, to improve uh, locality management, for example, okay? So the idea is to follow a little bit those ideas and try to homogenize the heterogeneity that, that we provide. And in practical terms, uh, this is more or less how, what I think it should look like and what it looks like. So it's MPI plus OpenMP where you can offload. So you can offload from the GPP side to the accelerator side, and you can leverage the offload Clauses. So we have OpenMP. You can leverage the offload clauses of of OpenMP. One thing regarding the homogenizing heterogeneity. One thing that I believe is, I personally, I, 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 well, this is a matter again of this philosophical stuff. I don't like very much this fact that OpenMP, for example, for for heterogeneous thing ended up proposing or defining a different syntax for the way of generating parallelism inside the offloaded kernels. I personally believe that the same approaches that we use at the outer level in the host, the same approaches should be, should be and can be, and it's allowed by the standard, but it's not focused on by the people, is, can be used at the inner level. This lets you reuse codes, which would be the standard code that you would use on a standard SMP here, same source code you can use on the SMP that you have here. Okay, and this is a little bit the, the idea. We we would support the, the offloading from the from a external host to to the cluster to the local cluster here, but the cluster, but the, which is this eight uh, or four cores in the case of the test chip. Uh, this is actually or can be actually self-hosted system. It's actually running Linux here and it's actually self-hosted with four with four vector cores, so you can really run this. OpenMP uh, taskified loops, for example. Okay. You can, because the core is a SIMD, is a, not SIMD, it's a vector core. You can, well, who cares whether the syntactic SIMD or vector, the semantics is, is essentially the same. So essentially, you can take the Pragma OMP SIMD syntax and you can, and you can have your compiler generate vector code for this for this thing where actually the programmer has already said that it is parallel and should be vectorized, let's say. So this is the kind of, uh, we, I think would be the kind of this intermediate level of open MP MPI productive type of, uh, type of uh, programming approach. We have some, some in order to do initial experiments and to, well, to do initial codes before the compiler was actually doing or is doing a whole bunch of good vectorizations you can really use intrinsics, okay? And we support, we did the compiler to, to actually support the intrinsics where you have four, four instructions. You have the, the essentially for every instruction, you have a, a, an intrinsic, you have the additional data types that represent these vectors. And, uh, and we can, you can write code uh, based on that. Actually following a little bit this, and I think this is an important stuff, which is the, this vector length agnostic type of programming of the of the of the um, of the ISA, which is is there in is is there in RIS five, but it's also there in 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 ARM, 
which is this kind of, uh, I presented this kind of communication between the application and the runtime where the application actually forever, I want to do this loop, but for uh, actually I ask him how, how many iterations can I do in this? I would like to do this many iterations. How many can I do? And the T system tells you how many you can do. And this that you can do is the your vector length. So you do a bunch of those iterations in a single instruction, a bunch of uh, those iterations in a single instruction, and then uh, at the end, you increment the index with the number of iterations that you have done. This is the internal sequential way of executing this vector length agnostic code. This code is the same whether you have uh, your problem size is, is multiple of 256 or is not multiple of 256. It's the same. You don't have prologs and epilogues. You have a simple, simple code. This is the kind of uh, uh, vision that, uh, that we have, this vector length agnostic also. Nobody prohibits the, the, the hardware to tell you use a vector length of 17 because uh, I've seen in, my, in, in your last executions that uh, I detected that if you were to use a vector length of 17, I would be able to do better this, this execution. So this is a little bit the, what I wanted to, to, to show as the programming model. And this is, this is it. Essentially, this ends up being a hand a self-hosted kind of uh, processor. It can also work in a flow mode, but it can work in, in self-hosted uh, self mode. And, and you can write regular programs in, in it with, with these pragmas or with these intrinsics. Uh, if you even, even if you don't put any pragma, there is automatic vectorization in the compiler. Uh, so normally I, by practice, I put it, I tell the compiler not to vectorize, but if you take out this in the make file, the compiler will try to vectorize the loops it can. So I try to do it in a way that I, I kind of experiment a little bit and I look at what is the impact, slowly the impact of, of actually vectorizing certain loops. And these are clang, so it's a LVM, these are clang, standard cl clang classes. We are leveraging clang. We are actually, only thing is we are actually doing of course, the back end to generate code for, for the specific ISA and, 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 and essentially leveraging that. And what we had, we had the problem with RISC five, and this was a problem is that at the moment starting the project, we had a V07, then now they are with getting to V0, V1. Well, we have done the compiler and we are supporting this intermediate, all these intermediate visions because actually our hardware as of today, the hardware is going to be this version. Next, in this next version of the hardware will be here, but this one is, is here. So we have to support it for the current chip, but in order to have usability and if you want to use it and, and we have to have cooperations with vendors, both in, in the RIS5, but also outside because the vectorization is kind of generic for other architectures. So we are, we are kind of following the, the standard. So just to mention, this this is not much more that essentially you can run many different versions of a sparse matrix vector that you can have. This is essentially the same that I already said. Just that the, the, there is not, in principle, there is a direct translation between intrinsic and, 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 uh, and ISA instruction. In reality, I'm here because you, what you name, what you declare are variables of this given time. In reality, the compiler does register allocation that's instruction scheduling. So the actual order in which the instructions will be in the binary is not necessarily this one. So that's instruction scheduling, that's spill code injection if needed. Actually can do optimizations on this, okay? So you end up specifying, and, and it's true because sometimes this approach doesn't have the flexibility to, to express uh, directly all the, all the, all the things that you may want to do with intrinsics, but the compiler does uh, sometimes to intelligence. Sometimes uh, it still has, let's say, opacs or functionalities that are not implemented. And, and the, the important thing is this kind of design activity where we are designing the, the looking at the applications, we're designing the compiling and co-designing the compiler itself. In, it, in this case, they were designing the compiler optimizations. And this is what I mentioned before, this vector length agnostic type of type of programming. So the, the essential thing would be, I would like to devote the last part of the thing to, to show what are the, the development environments that we have done to for 
for us and for people to be able to develop applications and and try to understand what are the the good and the bad things and the limitations and of, of our approach and of, of our platform and, and actually decide this this kind of holistic co-design. So should we implement something in the compiler? Should we implement it in the hardware and modify the hardware? Should we implement it in the application and promote a given programming practice? Okay. And I will be talking about two two SDBs, two software development vehicles. One of them is a software emulator of the RISC-5 vector architecture, which we have had for a long time. And uh, we are, I will be talking about the hardware, actually the actual RTL that is being designed is now implemented on a on an FPGA and it's actually available and it's actually booting Linux and, and, and we are starting to to run and tune applications and learn and improve the RTL based on the experiences from that. And the first of these two uh, software development vehicles is this uh, vector uh, emulator, which essentially lets you write uh, the, the codes that I showed you before, either with intrinsics or with pragmas or with automatic parallelization. Uh, with the core within the current scope within current techniques implemented in the, <clears throat> in the vectorization capabilities but let lets you compile that with llvm let generates a binary and this binary is executed on a risc 5 platform can be i have it here can be scalar risc 5 and this is the platform that we, we typically use but it can be on a qmu and uh, essentially you can you can run that code there the scalar the scalar platform is a scalar core, a scalar risk five core, which essentially traps on on uh, when receiving vector in trying to execute vector instructions. So we have the emulation library that emulates the vector instructions. And by the way, because it gets control at that point in time of the program, it generates a, a trace file. So actually, a simple ASCII trace file saying I've executed this instruction. These were the arguments. These were the so it's just a trace file of that, which we essentially convert into the trace file format of Parallel. This is a trace ASCII file, a standard, standard trace file, and we have a, a filter, which essentially is just, a, I think it's a Python script that just translates uh, translate the format and puts it in the Parallel format that, that, I, that I described. Okay. This trace in Parallel can be visualized with Parallel. By the way, the whole framework, the whole environment is available here. You can download it. And if you want to experiment and do some codes, you should be able to download everything, the compiler, the emulator, the, the Parallel configuration files to the Parallel and the Parallel configuration files to look at the traces, as well as this other part here, which is a timing model. This thing here is only a sequence of instructions or sequence of addresses or sequence. And, and what we have is this other module, which is just a simulator, a typical simulator for architecture people, okay? Trying to introduce timing, a timing model with some assumptions of what are the cut sizes, what are the, the latencies of things, and, and this is what it is. So, but essentially, that essentially extends the trace file. So generates as output the same trace file plus extended additional events. So in the, in the file, just puts additional events with information about uh, timing, okay? And this is what we have. So essentially, yes, this is just to mention what I, what I already said. Maybe one a couple of important things on the behave, behave is the, the emulator. We can emulate um, the vector lens you like, okay? So you, you define it and it can be, I don't know, 16 elements, but it can be 256 as the hardware, or you can emulate what would be how would the program run with if the vector length was 10,000? I don't know. It's, you can emulate any any vector length, what it will generate in terms of, of course, apart from the, from the um, no, it will, sorry, it will generate a, a trace file, as I said. And uh, the only thing is this trace file, the, the, it has no timing model because so what we have is one vector instruction per cycle, okay? So we put them one per cycle, has no timing model, so it only has the sequence. But still, the sequence is of, of vector instructions. 
given that they are also annotated with their program counters, their opcodes, what are the registers they use, what are the addresses or indexes they use, it's very useful information to try and, and understand what is the program doing. Certainly when you paralyze it with, with, uh, with uh, intrinsic, for example, but also if it's a totally automatic paralyzing and, and you can really see what the compiler is, is generated. One thing the emulator does not generate is scalar instructions, okay? We don't, because we don't intercept them, okay? And it also generates the actual vector lengths because of this vector length agnostic, you, your program requests a given vector length, but the hardware may, take, may give you back a decision of, so this is actually emulated, uh, generated. And then there's an API that in your source code, you can, you can enable or disable this tracing if you want to reduce the size of the traces, or you can actually add information, for example, information about which routine you are entering in or exiting. You can do it with this API, or if you want to emit information about certain values in your program, you can also do it with the interface. Apart from that, it's, so it's a standard. So this is how you do it, this tracing on off, and this is essentially how you compile and how you run it. You run it with an LD preload with the instrumentation library. You run your vector program. The important thing, this is a standard vector pro program that runs Linux. And the only thing is it has some vector instructions, okay? But it's, it, it, can, it can have all of the, all of the, the IO, everything. It can be a, a standard regular program. The MUSA is the simulator. You have parameters to simulate the core and say what's the reorder buffer size, what's the latency of instructions, all, all these, these things can be can be parameterized. And uh, it actually generates this additional information on the same trace, which includes timing, for example, when every instruction, when is it decoded, when is it issued, when is it executed, completed, or graduated. For a memory accesses, how many, for a instruction, how many hits for load and stores, how many hits or misses it did. With that, because with this, uh, you can obtain a trace and you can do these parametric sweeps and you can you can do studies of, with a cache of this size, what is the impact of different latencies of the instructions, okay? And uh, depending on, I don't know, uh, the number of instructions that are issued or what is the impact of cache size depending on the vector length, maximum vector length that we specify. Or, or what is the uh, what, what was this? What is the impact of, yeah, some policies about uh, controlling what to cache and what not to cache? So the simulator can have some of these uh, additional features to say, I I want to play with uh, what cache allocation policy. So this is this is the kind of uh, the kind of information that you can get plus the other information which is the traces and on the traces. You can see for uh, the whole for the whole timeline for the whole set of instruction. Uh, for example, this was 500, and because I said one there's one instruction per cycle here because there's no timing in the in the trace itself. So this this means this was 500,000 instructions that that were simulated here. This is the memory address. So the, and what we paint, this is a still a single function of time. If you look at it, 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 it is a single function of time. The only thing is so compact, so con, so condensed that we actually represent the points where it changes the value. This is a, one of the ways of rendering of Paraver. The points where it changes value, so you can see the memory access pattern. So can you see this kind of linear stride, linear access to one structure, linear access to another structure? Of course, you have to zoom if you want to see the details. But to the same thing, you can apply tables and, and the table will tell you now this is the memory address space. It says you are accessing something in the low address range, something in the medium address range and something in the high address range. By the way, the thing in the high address range is very few addresses. This is very few addresses. This is from a given address to another given address. So you can see the memory address map. Color by how frequently, how free the statistic can be, how frequently this is. This is accessed, but the statistic can be which is the actual instruction that is actual accessing. This is a load, these are stores. So it's, it's the, the mechanism that you have to analyze traces. You can also look at program counters, for example, instead of memory addresses, what is the program counter? And you see the loop structure of the, of the program, okay? You can look at vector lengths. And you can see this was for a sparse matrix vector and you use as vector length, the, you try to read the whole row of a, 
of a sparse matrix vector CSR algorithm, and sometimes the rows have more elements, sometimes they have less. And what you see is that when they have many, many elements, this uh, vector length agnostic approach is essentially what ends up, this is the requested vector length and this is the granted. The machine has a given vector length. When you request more than, grant, than, than available, you have, actually the machine does the, this kind of uh, chopping of the iteration space and you have to iterate several times. And when your requested vector length is small, you actually get your requested vector length. It's a, it's a useful information, not only with this, this had no time in, in them, but you can, if you use the ones with Musa, with the standard, you can have instruction timing. And in this case, this axis represents the execution time, estimated execution time for that, for each individual instruction by um, by Musa, for example, and in this case here, for example, you have the loads, these are the blue are the loads and take more time than some other instructions. There are regions where there seems to be very large estimated execution times. You can do that and compare it with the memory access pattern. I mean, looks is kind of correlated, partially correlated. So this is the memory access pattern for this algorithm. And this is part of the, I think it is part of an HPCG kind of algorithm. You can do even more some because the semantic module of Paraver is, is uh, has some functionalities which are can be used to compute, for example, LRU stack distances. And you can you have on the sequences of addresses, you can really compute the LRU stack distance. And you can see what uh, get estimates of what would be the cut sizes that would make all of these LRU stack distance to fit into the cache or not. So you can get inside of for which phases of the code, what would be possible relevant cut sizes, rather than the typical stuff that we saw here, which is you do the simulation for the whole program, you have this cut size, this is the, this is the execution time. Maybe you can get more inside by looking at the, the variability inside the, the fine grain variability. Well, I don't know, I, I had several of these, it's not a matter of of uh, of going into them very much. I don't know, you have here, for example, this is the profile of the program counter. So essentially you see there was an instruction in this program counter. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vector instructions. Next instruction is a scalar, next instruction is a scalar, next one is vector. Here I have a, a thing of six or seven scalar instructions between two vector instructions. So this kind of analysis obtained out of a real run of a program and you see, you see the, the program is a very dynamic stuff, okay? And so it's, it's, it's not uh, always a simple loop, has many different, possible many different iteration cones and within the, the, the program execution. You get a feeling of, I don't know, what would be your, your level of look ahead that you have to have in the scalar core if you want to get to the next vector instruction. Here, very short, but here you may have a little bit more of look ahead. So what should be? Is, is, a, is, a, is an in order or is a, I don't know, what, what is the reorder buffer size of the, of the scalar core, the avispado that you need to, to look in order to, to get to the next instruction, okay? So this is the kind of information that you can do applied for, for large, uh, for real large applications, or maybe probably I can limit here. Here, for example, this is what is the index these are the indexed loads and this is the indexing access pattern. So the memory access pattern of within gather instructions, okay? And, and you can analyze it and see how much uh, in terms of um, how many, one thing is how many addresses, the only thing, the other thing is how many catch lines, the other thing is even could be even how many pages. So this is the kind of things that you can, that you can analyze. You can look at the registers. So I'm going to skip because I can. I want to finalize. I, I had a lot of cases here for different applications. So object detection application, for example, done by some of the partners with the neural network and, and looking at the program counter, the memory addresses, or even the LRU stack dependent distances. So there is useful insight for, for both for the application developer. Sometimes we end up telling the application developer this, we believe this can be improved at the level of application. Sometimes it's for, for the architecture saying this is the cut size that would be better. Something similar for stencil applications for using the petrol by the petrol industry. 
So it, this was an interesting example experience because it did vector very relatively complex source code. It vectorized well uh, from scratch. It was interesting. We did other uh, intrinsic based versions and and you could do the parametric studies of which of those versions gets better with different cut sizes. But it's it's uh, just to, to give you a, a feeling of that it can be used on many, many areas. It's not only, it can be image processing, visualization, or object recognition, but can be numerical simulation or even, I don't know, rather processing. So the, the next thing is, so that was on DSDB and I would like, if you want, I would like to encourage you to, to use it and port applications to it. The other thing is we have this FPGA implementation where we have implemented the same RTL that we have in the, in the real hardware. Okay, and essentially, <coughs> essentially you can, you can run the applications. There were status of some, this is still under development there. But essentially, it's booting Linux and you can run applications. And we are still having results of comparing the vector executions compared to the scalar executions. And we are actually comparing to other platforms and seeing how well we are in terms of flops per cycle or in terms of elements per cycle. So this is a very preliminary kind of stuff, but it's very interesting and very useful inside because we are kind of comparing the different views as well as the what the CAD tools will tell you. For, for very fine green things. We are actually using this as the, the way of designing or, or improving the RTL. We have already taped out the chip, but we are actually improving what would be the RTL improvements for the next, next version of the chip. So uh, let me just finalize then saying, fundamentally, I, I have this vision of, uh, or this perception that that we are in this change from the late, or we should be in this change from latency to throughput. And latency is very deep in our genes as of today. And it's a difficult change. It takes time to have to change our mindset, our mentality. And it's actually, uh, it's actually a, a matter of mentality. It's a matter of, of in many, many makers, it's the mindset of programmers. So for those of you who are actually developing applications or I would like to encourage to to try and try and forget a little bit about hard resources. I know they are very shiny, they are very, but it's very important to have maintainable code and have dynamically and adaptable code and and, and focus on the program logic. Okay, and uh, I think that uh, this is the the I believe this is the right way to to go into the into the future. Okay, so just. I wanted to say that this is for exascale, but this is this is for now, and this, maybe this is for yesterday. Okay. So with this, I I finalized the presentation. I don't know if there's time for some questions. I'm sorry, it was a bit fast on the last time, but on the last part. But you can you have the material. You can have a look at it, and you can download it if you if you want. Is there any question? I actually have a question. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. And uh, yeah, I really, I really appreciate it. And, and as my question goes thus, do you think how, how has the open source community uh, uh, play up with performance and uh, analysis in supercomputing, super, super, uh, supercomputing uh, technologies? And do you think uh, the major, what, what do you think are the major players right now? Is it the open source or the proprietary technologies? No, I, th I, think, I think the community has been open source. So the tools, if you, I mean, we have been open source. You have uh, other tools in the, I mean, in the pop project, you have uh, Scalaska kind of tools and you have other tools. And I would say everybody tends to be, the actual developments tend to be, tend to be, open source so that's what i would so you have some vendors that have their own things and but uh, i would believe if you want to look for generality for for portability across different platforms yeah i, th I think the open source approach is is the right approach and um, yeah then that's that's my feeling
Any other question? Uh, professor, thank you for your long lecture. Uh, I have a short question. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, uh, top-down programming methodology is, is, a, is a kind of uh, good. Uh, so it means that is it the best methodology in your fee or, or, or what, what is the real benefit of the top-down programming in, in, your, in your area? I, I, I do think it would be good to, to do it, to follow or try to have a top-down approach to, to analyzing the, the problems, yes, because it's, it's a lot about the context on which you run something, what determines whether a given approach is, is good or bad. It's not, I think it's not always necessary to say, okay, I'm going to vectorize this routine, okay? And I'm going to implement, uh, de develop all the all the bottom routines, vectorize implementations of those, and very efficient. They are very efficient. They end up being very efficient according to your perception of how they will be used. And I think it's better to understand how really they are going to be used and what are the potentials rather than having, uh, and you may end up deciding for different multiple implementations. So certainly, I do believe that having a, a global vision of of the of the behavior of of your application, a global vision, rather than this typical approach of saying, "Oh, this is uh, this part of the code is ninety percent of my execution, and so I have to focus on it." I would try to avoid that. I would. I would try to avoid that because as, as we said with the load balancing, maybe the load, load balancing is something that may be generated here and maybe solved here. So it, it's not a bad thing in itself, uh, the, the load balancing. Maybe it's generated, if you only look at the region that is load imbalanced and you try to fix that region, that's one possible alternative but might be a difficult one for some, for some reason. And maybe you, you have opportunities to address the problems uh, somewhere else, okay? So I think this global vision is very, very, very important. This top-down approach. Uh, yeah. I see, I think I got it. Thank you very much for your explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I wish to thank uh, Professor Jesus Labarta for uh, the very nice uh, lecture that uh, he gave us today. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. And if Amalia does not have any any additional point, I think that now that we have one hour for taking lunch and and have a small rest. That's correct. So uh, see you all again in one hour from now at two p.m. CEST. And in case you have any questions or anything, just send me an email. Thank you, everyone.